Hello. Hi, Amit. Did you start the webinar? Yep. Did you start the webinar? Okay. I think it is live for everyone. I don't know how it works though. So if you click participants, you'll see panelists and attendees. Yeah, but why Dr. Panda is showing as attendees? No, so I'm moving in promote to panelist. So he should be here now. Oh, so since you started it, so you have all the controls. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes Dr. Dr. Panda. Okay, okay, good, good, okay. Um, because the host has stopped it, okay. So I'll share. I think somebody has to give me the access. Amir, can you do it? Yes, yeah, sure, go ahead, please. Okay. Can you also do it for me? Yes. No, it says though, even video, I cannot start. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Yeah, yes. let, let me see. Uh, And um, Arpan, you will do the, uh, even the, those two. Yes, Dr. Panda, uh -huh. I will show those examples. Yeah, yeah. Can you make us co-host, Amir? Can you see my screen? Yes, Dr. Panda. I yes, can. I can see your screen. I'm yeah, not, not in the presenter. Yeah, it is not uh, coming up in the presenter mode. How about now? Yeah, it looks good. But mm -hmm. a window is showing up, Dr. Panda, around your presentation. Mm. Which window is showing? Like, uh, yeah, yeah, this yeah, that one I don't know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get that. I, uh, are you are you sharing your screen or a PowerPoint? PowerPoint, should I uh, share the screen? Let's see. Mm. Yeah, with this new laptop, a lot of things have become messed up. I I need to. Okay, so now let's see. Um, if I share. Uh, how about now? Can you, I think we are seeing the same window again. Mm, full screen. How about yeah. now? Yeah, this hmm? is good. This okay. is good. Okay, okay. Okay, this is this is good. Uh, we'll be there. So yeah, can, I think. The, Arpan, but, Dr. Pada, it, can you not share your uh, video? No, it shows uh, there is an error. Okay. Uh, so, Deer, can you please enable that if I make you the host? For some reason, I'm the host. Oh, you're the host. Okay. Because I was not even a panelist in this. So, yeah, yeah. I, was so I saw you. Committee. Yeah, I saw you and I promoted you. So, oh, okay, I okay. just made you the host. Okay. Sorry, I missed what you need me to do. So, um, Arpan, other panelists cannot share their video. Oh, okay, okay. Just one second.
let me try with the And um, Amir, Hari, Arpan, um, after I cover the first part, I need to switch to another call and then come back. Okay. While you so, uh, so who is the host here, Dr. Panda? I think at this time, Sudhir uh, and Amir. I, I was the host originally. No, I don't think none of us are the host. Uh, yes. So I made Sudhir host, but I think he... But, uh, okay, so how were you able to start your screen share, Amir? I was able to share. I think as a panelist, you can share so now the video, so it's not coming. In the yeah. attendees. Yeah, but okay, uh, video is not coming yet, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I think now no one is the host. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know how to resolve this issue. So Sudhir is there or he dropped off? So Sudhir is in attendees. I hmm. I cannot promote him now. Oh my God. Okay. And you lost also your functions? Okay. You're also panelist. Okay. Yes. I think Saurabh is there, am I right? In the main lobby. Shall we restart the session or something like that? Like just log on again? Like end the webinar and uh, restart it. Okay, I'm not even getting an option of ending the webinar now. Hmm. Yeah, Saurav is a host now, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's host. Saurav? Yeah, I open. We I, cannot we cannot share our video and all. Start your video. It says host uh, has stopped it. Let me check that. Mm. Mm. 
Yeah, you should be able to share video now. Mm, let me try. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I can do it now. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Swaro. Mine is coming <laughs> reverse. I don't know. Any particular thing? Background? Uh, um, no. I, um, I didn't select any background. I know. It shows correctly for us. Oh, it shows correctly? Okay. So it might be to me. It is showing the other one. Okay. Okay, I think um, we can start whenever Sudhir or whoever is ready, we can. So uh, Sudhir is an attendee, sort of. You, do you want to promote him, please? Um, sure. Let's Hi Sudhir, you can you should be able to start your video now. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. You can sorry for the delay. I think yeah, I was not added as the yeah, let me give a quick intro to the yeah. speakers that are joining for this session. Um, Okay, do you, Dr. Panda, do you want to wait for some more? Yeah, yeah, we, we are flexible. Yeah, yeah. We, we can wait for a few more minutes. Yeah, we have like 27 participants. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's wait. People are joining another two minutes or so. so. Yeah, sure. So while we are waiting, I think for the attendees, um, the slides are available here. Uh, as indicated, please feel free to download a copy from, from this website. Yeah, maybe meanwhile, I think we can go ahead with the introduction. Sure. So hopefully people will join. Yeah, so welcome you all uh, for the uh, Hot Internet Connects tutorial track one. We have the second tutorial. We had a great tutorial in the morning. Now uh, the tutorial topic is high performance machine learning, deep learning and data science. The speakers for this are uh, Dr. TK Panda, Dr. Hari Subramani, Arpan Jain and Dr. Amir Shafi. In the interest of the time, let me give a brief intro. I have, we already introduced Dr. Panda and Hari, so let me introduce Arpan. Arpan received his B.Tech and M.Tech degrees from um, in information technology uh, from ABB AAATM India. Currently, Arpan is working towards his PhD degree in computer science and engineering at Ohio State University. His current res research focus lies at the intersection of HPC and uh, deep learning frameworks. He is working on parallelization and uh, distributions, distribution strategies for uh, large scale DNN training. Um, yeah, he's actively contributes to projects, uh, high performance deep learning, uh, MVAP H2, GTR, um, and LBA and then deep learning frameworks. He's a member of IEEE. And Dr. Amir Shafi is currently a research scientist in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at um, OSU. 
um, is was a Fulbright uh, visiting scholar at MIT uh, in uh, 2010 and 11 academic year, um, where he worked on the silk technology. Dr. Shafi uh, received his PhD in computer science from University of Portsmouth, UK in 2006. He got his uh, bachelor's in software engineering degree from NUSST Pakistan in 2003. Uh, his current research interests include architecting robust libraries and tools for big data computation with emphasis on machine and deep learning applications. Um, he co-designed and co-developed a Java-based MPA-like library called MPJ Express. Now, welcome you all um, for this session. Yeah, I look forward to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Sudhir. Yeah, any, uh, yeah go any ahead. Any questions? Yeah, we can use either. Uh, I think morning we uh, we found the Zoom chat to be more convenient, but uh, either here or uh, either in the Zoom chat or Slack, either way is fine. We will be watching over that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have not logged to Slack yet, uh, Amir or Arpan. Are you? I, on? I'm in. Yeah, we, okay. I'm okay. Slack. Okay. We good. will inform you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. So thanks a lot again, Sudhir, uh, for the uh, kind introductions. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, some of you attended the morning tutorial where we focused a lot on the high performance networking. Uh, now we go to the uh, little bit of the upper layer and it's titled high performance machine learning, deep learning and data science. And as I indicated, um, the slides are available here. Uh, so please feel free to uh, uh, download. But before we start again, we can give you a few minutes if anybody would like to just post it in the chat, introducing a little bit about yourself and what uh, you want to learn from this tutorial. Just uh, post it in the chat if you want. No? Okay, uh, we can proceed and as we go on, uh, if you have any questions, uh, again, as uh, uh, Sudhir indicated, uh, please feel free to post it in the chat. So the outline will be like this. Um, we have a four hours uh, time window here. Um, so um, we'll be starting like it's a one o'clock, might be around 2.45 or something. We'll take a 15 minutes break uh, and uh, then come back. Um, that is, uh, to 245 uh, West Coast and uh, uh, 545 in the East Coast, um, 445 Central. Uh, so we have a lot of materials to cover, but a lot of exciting materials to cover. So we'll start very quickly with an introduction. I mean, if some of you are very um, uh, just a newer, newbie to this field, uh, we'll just talk about a little bit about the past, present, and future of AI, uh, talk a little bit about machine learning, deep neural networks, just at a high level, providing a diverse overview of the diverse applications of deep learning. So we'll start with the 100,000 feet level, and then gradually we'll see we'll come down, and then we'll go to the 5,000 feet level. So after we have the introduction, we'll try to go over understanding the machine learning and deep learning frameworks, how these frameworks are coming, which are popular, uh, which are more formally being used, and then go into the crust of the problem, like why these frameworks are there. Overview of the execution environments, what these frameworks do internally. And with that kind of a background, we'll move to the parallel and distributed DNN training. The, the challenges out there, uh, we'll also take a look at the distributed machine learning uh, algorithms, what is happening, and also data science using the DASK. And once we get a good understanding of these three fields, we'll flip the switch a little bit and then try to take a look at what is happening in the HPC. Um, some of you might be familiar with there. Uh, we'll take a look at the latest trends in the high performance computing architectures, and then we'll try to bring these fields together. And we'll try to outline what are the broad challenges in exploiting HPC technologies for DL, ML, and data science. And then we will be going over a set of solution and case studies. So, just in the community, how people are working on, what are the latest performance numbers, scalability numbers. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the DL solutions first, followed by ML solutions, followed by DAS solutions. 
And then we'll be talking about a set of open issues and challenges because these are very vibrant fields, as you know, uh, continuously newer and newer challenges are coming. And especially if you are a student uh, attending this tutorial, you will get an idea of uh, what are the uh, open challenges people are working on. And then we have a very nice set of hands-on exercises. So we have a, a GPU cluster here um, in, in our lab. And we have actually, we'll introduce before the break uh, how to create accounts on there. Uh, some of you actually used it in the morning. Uh, that is to do purely networking kind of experiments. But here also we have GPU. So you will be able to actually run uh, machine learning, deep learning application. So we'll go over those uh, some of those hands-on exercises and then finish. So if you take a look at broader look, this field, broadly three terminologies are there. AI, which is the bigger picture. Then below that is a subset of machine learning. And then within that, there's a subset called deep learning. If you take a look at these, these concepts are nothing new. It has been there for, in fact, 1950, people are talking about AI. In fact, next slides I'll show even, even earlier than that, people were talking about intelligence. So all these ideas were there. And then when the machine learning came, things became a little bit more translational. People started using some of these things. So if you take a look at machine learning, so the idea is that can, can we train the machines to learn? That's how the machine learning indicates. If I have a lot of inputs, so in this case, like images of cars. So our eyes are very powerful. It can actually identify uh, this is a car or this is not a car, but it has been trained over the years. But when we are a baby, we are not able to separate it out. So same thing happens like here. If I have a lot of inputs, I can do some feature extraction and then do this classification and then come up with a model. And once I have that model, if a new input comes, then the question is, can that model predict whether it is a car or not a car? So that is the typical process of this machine learning. So the deep learning actually goes even one step further. So we have this combined feature extraction at classification is, is being combined together into the single phase. And, and if you have, again, a lot of inputs, the same idea applies. Can we build this model through the machine? So the deep learning model, can we build based on the availability uh, of, of a large size of uh, images? And then if some new image comes, like a new car picture, so the question is, like, can the model help us to identify whether it's a car or not car? So in this context, I mean, here are some broad definitions. Of course, um, the machine learning has been there for many years. Uh, and this is where we'll spend a little bit more time on the deep neural networks. Um, and of course, there are a lot of examples, convolutional neural network, recurrent neural networks, hybrid networks. And this entire field, of course, here we'll be talking about more technologies, but there is also the other aspect, which is the data scientist. The data scientists are trying to use, if you're a person sitting in a bank or a person sitting in an insurance company or a person sitting in some pharmaceutical industry or a marketing uh, department, you have a lot of data. So how do you really make sense out of those? And this is where we'll be seeing whatever we do today, actually how it has how it helps to, to these end users and what kind of societal impact it has. So now if that is like a, in the previous slide, I started with 1950, but if you, if you go way, way back, here you will see like even from 1800s, people were talking about intelligence. Um, all these are like the great heroes uh, in the community uh, so, you know, being shown in the bottom in uh, like all these linear regression, Turing machine, PCA, everybody was inclined towards how the machine can really be intelligent and become more and more intelligent over the years. Electronic brain concepts started here, perceptron, adeline. In fact, at this phase, this used to be called like a golden age of, of, uh, of the AI field. Uh, a lot of new ideas came, new developments came. Uh, but then what happened, there was a dark age came also because people had a lot of ideas, but they were not able to really run these on computers, on real systems to, to, to show the effectiveness. And, and that's what exactly has changed recently. And then we'll see, especially with the advances in high performance computing, uh, CPU side, GPU, FPGAs, uh, DPUs, TPUs, a lot of these technologies are coming and that is changing the curve in a big manner. So whatever people had ideas are actually being really translated into the end use cases. So these are becoming more and more practical. And this is where we are seeing all these newer models, transformers, and all those things are gradually coming up. 
So if you take a very high level look at this ML and DL, some of you must be familiar, we'll, we'll get back to this in a later section. But all these things started, especially around like seven, eight years back. Uh, the ImageNet challenge came, some of you must be familiar, and 90% uh, of the team used GPU that time. Then Kaggle came, that is also the Kaggle challenge came, and then it provided free GPU access to participants, and that actually enabled. And then some of the data sets were also available. So you need computing, you also need data sets to try out your ideas. And once some of these things became common, then gradually we saw more and more momentum. So now if you see like on the right hand side, it is trying to show like on the June 2022, we have, uh, if you take a top 500 systems, the ranking, 152 of those 500 machines use GPUs. And that were also NVIDIA GPUs. And within NVIDIA GPUs, there is a break up here. As you can see the Tesla to 800, all, all the different kinds of GPUs are being used. And of course, NVIDIA also has dedicated DL supercomputers like a mini size to very large size, DGX1, DGX2, to SGX, et cetera. And then NVIDIA UOS, it is actually an Exaflop, Exaflop AI supercomputer using DGX H100. So action is not only restricted to GPU. I mean, the CPU sites are also evolving. I mean, um, you will see like a cascade, um, uh, all the modern uh, um, processors are <clears throat> gradually having more and more cores. Uh, in fact, we'll, try, we'll show you some numbers later on. You can also do deep learning based on CPUs, pure CPU, as long as you have access to a very large number of uh, CPUs. And of course, the AMD Epic, uh, Rome and Milan these days have uh, like a 64 cores per socket, uh, and especially the, the new Frontier system. Uh, that is the no number one now. And this is effectively also an AI system. People have in these days, any HPC systems is being renamed or rebranded just like an AI system. Fuga goes like this, also the frontier system. And, and while we are looking at these commodity systems, of course, the domain specific accelerators are also coming. So this is where like the graph core, uh, Cerebras, uh, TPUs, uh, Gaudi, a lot of those kind of very dedicated engines are also coming up, chips. And, and we can use those chips to, to really build the large scale systems. So if you take a very broad look here, like some marketing potentials, uh, you might have seen it from some places. It shows like here we are in 2022, it's like a little close to $15 billion market. But as you can see, the people are predicting exponential growth. And by 2025, we'll be crossing up to, of course, like a $36 billion market. And where these are being used? So this is like a prediction here, if the follow-up pointer is here, in the world markets 2025, they identify that these are the top 10 use cases. Uh, contract analysis to object detection classification, object identification, automated geophysical feature extraction, text query of images, content distribution on social media, predictive maintenance. Um, think of like the, the cars. Uh, most of the cars we go, many years back, it used to be a very strict uh, the mileage, you know, every 5,000 miles you go and change this, or 30,000 you do like this, 60,000 you do like this. But over a period of time, people are realizing those are some standard guidelines. But the actual maintenance depends on how you drive, where you drive. Okay, it depends on that. So the question is can we learn from there with a lot of data points? And then if we say, like, a, I'm from Columbus, Ohio, it may give some guidelines. Yeah, on this Honda, you, you need to do the maintenance at this time, or even you can make it very prescriptive. Based on my Honda history, it can actually tell me, give me a message saying, these days you get some reminders, you know, when the oil goes down 10%, you get a reminder, but it can be much more descriptive saying, Honda's patterns of failures are like these, um, with this failure, your vehicle is here, so you should be going in the next three months, change this part, okay? So these are called predictive maintenance. And these are huge things, not just, individual level, but think of all the airlines. I mean, this is where they, they put a lot of money and if they can actually predict this properly and take care of the maintenance, they don't have to do a lot of maintenance in a wasted manner. And that, that leads to revenues, that leads to reliability. So, so that's how the every field is trying to think how AI can help them. Patient data, medical data, we'll, we'll take a look at some of the examples. The, each hospital generates so many images, whether it is an X-rays versus MRI messages or pathology messages, sorry, images. Can we learn from there? 
um, instead of a pathology spending like a half an hour to look at the slides and determine the carry out the diagnosis, can machines help? And in fact, we have some concrete solutions. I'll show it to you later on. Um, that 30 minutes can be divided into like or or be shortened into 10 minutes before even pathologist looks at your um, uh, of your slide image machine would have done some analysis against patients in that hospital or the nearby hospitals and would have narrowed down saying yeah this this patient may have x y and g so so that actually reduces the time uh, for the pathologist and it has a big impact on the healthcare cost as you know in the us healthcare cost is rapidly rising so it is one of the way we can proceed. Similar thing, static image recognition. And of course, always wherever there is money, <laughs> there is a lot of need, especially the stock market um, can actually, I mean, the world fluctuates every day with so many things are happening, can actually you develop a model and the model will be predicting. Uh, and then and the, if you can use that model and, and invest properly uh, and then get a lot of returns, then, then you will be winning. So those are the kind of the things very high level, but now if you go a little bit below, some of these terminologies you might have heard or seen, but we'll just try to introduce that if somebody is not, is totally new, they can also uh, get warmed up with these concepts. So in the machine learning, at a high level, we have three kinds of classification. Is a uh, supervised learning, I indicated earlier, so you have some data. So there is a supervisor which is trying to not only like come up with the algorithm, but based on some information, you are trying to make sure that that learning and the processing is taking place. And then you are trying to <clears throat> determine the output. Whereas unsupervised learning is a little next level. It doesn't have any labels or anything. No human beings are involved, but the algorithm itself is trying to learn from here. The third one, which is gaining a lot of momentum is like a reinforcement learning, okay? So it is, based on some agents and environments, not only you come up with some algorithm, it actually takes back with some reward kind of uh, um, uh, behavior. And then from there, it sees which algorithm will be helpful and which algorithm will not be helpful. We'll see some examples uh, later on. So now let's see what is a deep neural network. I'm sure all of you would have seen, I mean, this kind of picture, where you open up any literature on DL, uh, you, you will see here. This is actually a three layer deep neural network or a DNN. Uh, typically input layer is not counted. We have a hidden layer one, hidden layer two. There are a lot of edges and then there are some um, uh, vertices. But the question is, how do you connect these? What should be the weights? And how many such layers should be there? And within each layer, how many such vertices should be there? Though that's what decides your model, okay? So that is a like a, a graphical representation, but if you take a look at like a really what happens within our brain, it's very similar. I mean, if you take a look at a biological neuron, I'm sure in your biology class, in your high school, uh, you would have been exposed to this. Uh, we, we have uh, cell bodies, we have nucleus, dendrites, uh, there are impulses, they are carried towards the cell body, then they get moved through action, and then it, it goes to the uh, other nucleus. <clears throat> this is how we have billions of such neurons in our brain. Now, how do we really translate that into the mathematical model? So in the mathematical model, you will exactly see the same things. Like there will be actions, there is dendrites, there is a cell body, uh, we have different weights, um, as you can see here, um, different W0, W1, W2, then you do some summation, and then that leads to an activation function, and that goes into the output action. So the scientists are trying to literally mimic how our brain works, and then try to take that into the, to the uh, deep learning. So this is where now the deep learning comes. Broadly, many of you know, there are two phases, like a training phase and inference. And training phase, as the name suggests, like you have a lot of data and then you are trying to learn. I gave an example of car earlier. You can think of the same thing as a human face. And, and soon you will see how that process works. There is a forward path, there is a backward path. But this is also very similar to how human beings or even animals, any, any living organism gets trained. A simple example I can give you, there is a, you would have seen um, a baby um, uh, when the baby is born, the baby doesn't have any concepts of a fire. So as the baby um, grows, I mean, sometime in the baby's life, I'm sure every baby would have put the finger on fire. 
Okay. And once you put the things, then the baby realizes that, oh, this is something hard. This is I should not be doing. So, so his or her neurons are being connected inside the brain. So that is the training which is taking place. So the baby will be doing this kind of mistake a few times. But after that, the, the brain learns that, okay, there is a fire. This is the color. I should not be touching it. Okay. So like this, throughout our life, we get trained. Whether it is social, whether you go and learn driving, um, uh, social skills, even classrooms. I mean, that's what we get trained continuously over the years. And then when a new situation comes, this is the inferency. So it might be you have learned driving, you have a lot of practice, 100 hours uh, you would have learned. But then you are driving in a new city, a new situation. The question is, are you able to drive in that place? And if you do it successfully, that means you have trained properly. If not, you may make a mistake, but then you need to also learn then that means your training is not complete. So exactly the same idea what we see in the real life is being applied into the machines. But then the question is, of course, when we take a human being, I said, like, I mean, we are continuously learning even sometimes until the death. But if you really want to make some of these examples I indicated earlier, and trying to translate that into an app or trying to take it to an application, it has to be, training has to be done faster. And this is where the biggest challenge comes. If you if you have a model and let's say it takes five years to train and that is what used to happen 20 years back, it doesn't have any use. But the question is, can I change that five years to five hours? That will make a very big difference or even to five minutes or five seconds, that will have a big impact on how I can use that model in, in real life situation. And, and that's what we'll be trying to see as we move along. So with this, let me stop here. Um, Arpan will has a very nice demo. It's called TensorFlow Playground. Um, anybody can uh, play with it. Uh, we'll introduce a lot of terminologies here um, to, to show you uh, the concepts uh, before we go into trying to uh, explain those things. Hello, Dr. Panda. Yeah, Arpan, please. Yeah, yeah I can see your slides. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing my slide or yes. the, the web page? Yeah. Uh, the slides, uh, the web page, web page. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so let's consider a few simple examples and see how we can train a deep neural network on those simple examples. So there are like this is a very good site. If you want to play with the deep neural networks and see how different hyperparameters, yeah. Would you mind uh, uh, putting a slideshow? I mean, at least make try to make the window bigger. Okay. Is it uh, is it not uh, visible? Okay. Let me reshare. Okay. Let me reshare my screen. It Can you see it now? Is it better? Um, a little bit bigger, I think. We yeah, have I that uh, Sudhir in the slide form also, but uh, here it is yeah, a right. uh, yeah, website. Not, uh, yeah. Worry about it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So is it uh, visible or? Is yeah, it yeah. Like, uh... No, no, it is visible. It is visible. It is visible. It is visible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. So, so in this example, we are going to consider a few a uh, few examples like the few use cases like how the simple data will look like so we have uh, different types of data sets here and this is the website where you can play with the deep neural networks and see how different hyperparameters affects the training of uh, deep neural networks so let's consider this example so here you here we have uh, two categories orange and blue so on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we have two features, like uh, the features are, you can consider features as a property of uh, these uh, data points, okay? So we have feature one on the x-axis and feature one, two on the y-axis, which is called x1 and x2 here. So now our task here is to classify these data points into orange and blue categories. And we want to train a deep neural network for it. So here you can see we have, we have a kind of a deep neural network where we have two layers. Layer one has four neurons and uh, layer two has two neurons. So let's try to train this neural network on this data set. If you click on the play button, 
And you can see that uh, now it is training this deep neural network on this data set. You can see that the training loss is going down and our train deep neural network is able to classify between blue and orange data points. And uh, here, there, here we have some hyperparameters. Don't worry about them. We are going to discuss uh, them in the later section of this tutorial. But the objective here is to show that how you can easily train a deep neural network on a sample data set and see how these hyperparameters affect the overall training. Like uh, if you want to consider a complex data set where the, the boundaries are not that well defined, like in this case, the boundary is this circle. However, in this case, the boundary is something like this. So can we train a deep neural network on this one? You can see that we are able to successfully train it, but in, in some more complex data sets like this one, we may need to increase the deep neural network size. For example, on this one, like you can see that uh, in this case, our deep neural network is not big enough to classify this data set. So, so you can play with the uh, uh, different kinds of deep neural networks and uh, the data sets on this uh, website. Now let me move to the another example where we are showing that how a train, how you can use a train deep neural network. So this is a, a ResNet 50 model trained on ImageNet data set. So it is on the Onyx website. So you can easily, you can also access this one. So let's say if we give a picture of cheetah to this uh, deep neural network, you can see that it is able to classify or it is able to find that this image is of cheetah with the 100% hundred percent confidence. If I change it to, let's say a lighthouse, you can see that it is 97% sure it is a beacon, but it can be a breakwater also with the 3% confidence. So you can see that uh, the, the, how deep neural networks can easily classify these kinds of images if they are uh, trained properly. Here we are doing the classification on GPU, uh, GPU server. So it is taking around 394 milliseconds. But if we change it to let's say CPU assembly, then you can see that uh, the similar image is going to take around 1,333 milliseconds. It's not that bad. Like uh, it's, uh, it's around four times the GPU, but you can still do the inference on the CPUs. So the, the links are on the web, on the slides. Feel free to go to this website and uh, test it them out. You can also upload your own image if you want. Uh, in the slides, you will find that uh, I uploaded an image of a library from the Ohio State University, and it was able to find that it is uh, an image of library. So this is the power of uh, deep neural networks. Dr. Panda? Yeah, yeah. So let me... Uh... Any question till now? Sorry. Do we have any question? Any questions? I, I don't see... Um... Yeah, we don't have it as of now. Okay. So this, this just shows like a... Um, the examples of like a training and inference. Okay, so if you are trying to teach a class or something, I mean, these are all available on the website to your students, you can actually train them. So with that kind of a background, let's take a little bit more deeper look at some of the applications to get a feel why we should be working in this, this field. So one example here of the machine learning, um, I, I, I assume all of you are able to watch my slides, am I right? Yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. So, so take a look at credit card fraud detection. And I'm sure many times over the over the years, sometimes you might have got a call from your bank saying, okay, your credit card is being being authorized or charged by somebody else. I mean, this is a very common um, occurrence. And and if you take a look how that field is evolving here, it's exactly, I mean, there is a big thing here. It's 112 million has been lost due to credit card fraud in 2019. It is a, it's a huge, huge amount of money. This is in the US. 
So all the banks are trying to improve with the machine learning model and especially here is the unsupervised techniques. So basically based on your transactions or, or even you can correlate. I mean, I can give some instances like a, let's say 10 years back, uh, whenever I used to go to some foreign country, you will see your credit card will not work. You At that time, there used to be a mechanism. You can call your bank saying, oh, I'm going to Europe and then, then they will enable um, so that the transaction, when it comes from there, they will get authenticated. So the broad idea is that if I'm living in some place and they are trying to understand my pattern of the credit card transactions, and all of a sudden, if I see that a credit card is being authenticated from a different country or a different place for, for a different region or for a different amount or a big amount, suddenly it raises the red flag. And that's what it's trying to, you have that model based on your USS pattern, and then it is trying to predict like what is the probability of the fraud? And then based on the call you do and all those things, then you have to give some explanation and there might be a human advisor is trying to uh, um, analyze that and, and then trying to see whether it is a, a valid or invalid, okay? But over the years, things have become really sophisticated. These days, in fact, I'm sure all of many of us travel, we don't get those kind of uh, messages because now the system is able to not only like uh, trying to understand my pattern, but if I have charged, let's say I go to Germany, I have a, uh, I have purchased the airline ticket using my credit card, it actually understands that in such and such date, I'll be going to Germany. So, so if I go in the next day and charge something from Germany, it knows that I am the valid user. So it doesn't actually, it, so it has improved on that model, okay? So it doesn't even show that it is a probability of fraud. So, so like this, people are trying to come up with a better and better model to make sure that the valid cases are not being, there is there is no like a false prediction, okay? There could be some truth. If your credit card got lost or somebody stole your number and trying to charge, those are the cases they want to, to, to catch. Here there are some more applications like a, think of like scientific simulations and design, manufacturing. Many things are going on with respect to simulation. I'm sure you know, like these days, all the aircrafts, let's say Boeing or Airbus and all, are completely being simulated. There is no concepts of the wind tunnels and all. But that is the traditional HPC. Now what is happening is AI is being embedded into the HPC. So for example, if I have many different parts or in each part, I have a lot of different parameters. When you try to simulate, let's say I have uh, three degrees of freedom and, and the, each degree has five different options. So then total number of commissions are five is to three, five times five times five, okay? So there are like a 225, uh, right? Yeah. Um, combinations. And uh, then the question is, all these combinations may not lead to me to the right solution. And if I have done that simulation earlier, can I learn from that simulation? So that when I do the next time, it is not, it's automatically eliminating those cases where it will not be making any productive um, uh, conclusion. So in that way, I can actually simulate these things much more faster. So that is what like an AI driven simulation which is going on. So these are the traditional field, but let's take an example of some art. So here there is an example on the right hand side here. So let's say you take your favorite painter, let's say Van Gogh. Of course, Van Gogh has a style. Question is, can the machine learn his style of painting? It's very hard because painting is something as you know, art lies with the brain of individual person. So here what he's saying, if I give a doodle and if I have a trained model of how Van Gogh paints, if I have a doodle, can the machine actually paint a picture as if Van Gogh has done it, okay? But of course, there is a lot of ethical issues here. I mean, should we be doing it or not? That is altogether a different issue. We'll not discuss that uh, now, but, uh, but think of the complexity. Uh, these are very complex situation and the question is, can deep learning help there? Simple examples like I'm sure many of you would have seen, I mean, you go to, some country, I actually go through this many times. I try to bring some uh, cookies or chocolates for my daughter. And then you are in a uh, some country, you cannot read all the languages. Uh, you want to study the ingredients. Uh, Google Translate will help you. Similarly here, there is another example. Uh, um, if you land in a foreign country, you don't know the directions from the airport, use your Google Translator and then try to uh, get the um, directions. Of course, at the very high end, is the uh, self-driving cars and, uh, and, and the Tesla 
uh, this is the kind of the at the higher end you always continuously hear about uh, how the accuracy has been improving how people are trying to do better and better uh, driving kind of things and that is at the big end but even a small end i'm sure this is actually a picture taken from the OSU campus uh, for the last few years uh, these small vehicles are continuously moving around in the campus uh, if you want to order some uh, lunch or breakfast or coffee uh, you don't have to go to the cafe uh, you just order through your iphone and and these are actually they have a, these these small vehicles uh, they have wheels they have a camera they have uh, uh, even a uh, uh, even internally i don't know what logic they have i'm sure some some kind of a gpu which is there it is trying to actually um, find all the directions the entire all the sidewalks roads have been mapped and uh, and it actually does avoidance like even if some people come it actually stops and then after that it says it is safe to move so like this these vehicles are continuously moving and that will have impact a significant impact in distribution of groceries food packages mails and here this is on the ground same thing you can think of the drone so these are the technologies which are which will be the next uh, technologies for the next decade uh, where we will need all these kind of ai solutions i mentioned about this pathology example earlier um, like a medical things i mean just like every day every hospital a lot of patients go uh, if i go uh, to a doctor the doctor asks me to take some uh, uh, blood samples urine samples they they create a, a slides from these then they try to study trying to see whether i have some um, either a very complex like a cancer to um, anything else could be happening and of course these are huge images as you can see from the images these pathologists are very much trained over the years to 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 really detect a slide and then see what what kind of disease you could be having now the question is can we transfer that kind of a knowledge to machine and then and the build a model so that even the before the pathology comes your samples are being analyzed and then being narrowed down to, to saying what kind of disease you have. So now let's take it with that kind of a very high level picture. Let's try to go a little bit details to understand where this complexity of computations and all are coming. Okay, why we need really HPC uh, machines for this kind of application. So let's take a very um, common example of computer vision application uh, by default. These are the CNNs, convolution neural networks. Uh, typically these there are multiple stages here um, if you would have taken a pattern recognition class or computer vision class you would have got exposed to all these concepts so let's say we have a simple example of like this this uh, photo of a word we want to identify or describe it what that picture identifies so 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 that means it consists of a lot of pixels and from those pixels we take it through multiple steps um, some convolution max pooling fully connected layers nx binary classification in the end we want to do to say what this picture identifies is it a bird is it a sunset is it a dog or it's a cat or some combinations that is the kind of the knowledge we are trying to extract from the image and and like this if we can identify that picture properly okay saying that yeah it will be like a bird at the evening at the sunset we can do those kind of description then we can catalog this image properly. We can, that is kind of the label for that image. And if you have a lot of images across birds, across sunsets, then we'll be able to do this uh, training properly with a very uh, high accuracy. And then when the new thing comes, there also we should be able to do the inferencing. So in all these things, there is a word called convolution. I'm sure all of you would have heard of this in your linear algebra class sometime. But if, if not, let's very quickly take a look. So the convolution, basically mathematical term, it looks like if I have like a uh, here, like a matrix and I have a filter and then I'm gradually moving that filter across the image and right hand side is actually showing that in an animation. I have a input feature map and then I'm trying to do the convolution to an output uh, feature map. And now if you see these convolution operations are like this, uh, you can see a lot of additions, multiplication, and this is where we need a lot of computing power. So what does that mean to a higher level? And this is where a lot of computer vision research has been continuously taking place to derive this kind of filters, okay? So let's take a very easy example. So let's say we have an image like this. Uh, let's say the, the each, each pixel is from between zero to 10. Uh, 10 is the highest is white zero is dark so the question is our eyes are very powerful and it can say that oh there is an edge here which is changing from white to black can the machine do it so in that context there is a filter 
if you do this convolution, in fact, you will get a solution like this, which will be saying that, yeah, this is from where I'm going to, to, to dark to white, and then white continues and then becomes a dark. So that means there is some kind of a transition which is taking place here. Okay. So that is the whole idea of these different kinds of filters. Um, this is for a detecting a vertical edge. Different different filters will give you different features. Uh, you can do vertical, you can do horizontal, you can do circular, square, all kinds of, and, and gradually comes to more complex. And then if I show an example here, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, with this picture, right? It's a very complex picture. As you can see, it, it's, it has all different shapes. So the question is, can we actually have a deep learning model or, or run those kind of convolution operations? And, and there is an answer to it. There is something, a filter called Sobel filter, okay? It may look very simple to us saying, oh, zero, one, two, but do you see where to place that minus one, minus two, minus one, zero kind of things. And if you do that, see the right-hand side. This purely, the machine is trying to extract the feature from, from that image. It is able to detect all the edges. But of course, this is a very compute intensive operation. And the question is, do we do it on the CPU? Do it on a GPU? This is just for one image. Think of like millions of such images. Can we do it in one CPU or one node of one server or do I need thousands of servers? So this is where the field is moving. And in the next part of the presentation, we'll try to see why those things are needed, not how to handle those kind of computations. Do you want to really program it at a lower layer? Or do you really want to take it to an, some higher level like TensorFlow or PyTorch or some other framework so that the entire ecosystem of the software is becoming much more easier for you to use? But at the very bottom, these kind of operations are happening. So with this, uh, let me hand it over to, to um, Arpan. Um, he will provide you a high-level overview of the machine learning deep learning frameworks. Um, and then gradually, we'll go into the execution environments, the need for parallel and distributed computing. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Arpan, you can you can share the slides and then. Okay. Continue. Okay. Yeah. So let I think you can see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just have a pointer. Are there any questions in the meantime from anybody? Do we see questions? If not, no, let's can. Sorry, go ahead. No, we don't see any questions. Okay. okay, okay. Thanks. Bye. Please, bye. Okay, thank you. So now we have some basic idea of uh, deep neural networks, what they are, and uh, the applications of uh, deep learning. Let's see how we can train those deep neural networks. How can we use uh, deep learning in our own application or use case? So. Over the time, several machine learning and deep learning frameworks have emerged. So the machine learning or deep learning framework is a high level framework that provides users the functionality of training, testing, and evaluating the deep neural networks and machine learning algorithms. So they hide most of the complicated mathematics so that as a researcher, you can focus on the design of uh, your deep neural network rather than on uh, implementing all the functions of your uh, deep neural network. So let's take an example here. So suppose that we have this mathematical equation. This is a very popular and common mathematical equation in uh, deep neural networks. It's called sigmoid operation. And here we are doing the weighted summation. So if we want to write this uh, equation in Minreva program, it will look something like this. So we are trying to use the matrix matrix multiplication to implement uh, this equation because we will, the same equation will be used by several neurons. So instead of uh, doing it multiple times, we can just uh, write it in a matrix format. So now this Minreva program can easily translate into this very simple data flow diagram. Like if you look at this data flow diagram, it is very simple. So we are just doing the multiplication here. Then we are having, then we are some adding on the bias and applying the sigmoid operation. However, if we want to optimize this equation or optimize the execution of this equation, 
This simple data flow diagram can easily translate into a complex one. For example, you may want to use data partitioning, multi-processing, or uh, multi-threading uh, features to accelerate uh, the execution. And you can see that uh, it can easily translate uh, into a very complex data flow diagram. As a researcher, you don't want to invest your time on uh, optimizing each and every function of your deep neural network. So that's why we have several machine learning and deep learning frameworks. But we have already saturated the peak potential of current generation architecture, be it a single GPU or a multi many core CPU. These deep learning frameworks are already optimized for all of these architectures. So you are using each and every core to train your deep neural network, but still it is not enough because we want to train larger and bigger deep neural networks. So to deal with the, the current limitations, we have uh, broadly, we have two strategies. The first strategy is if we cannot train it on a single processing element, let's try to use multiple processing elements. Like if we cannot train it on one GPU, let's use eight GPUs to train your model. So this is called parallel or distributed training of deep neural networks. The another approach is designing the dedicated hardware architectures for deep neural networks. So over the time, several dedicated hardware architectures have been developed for deep neural network training. For example, TPUs, IPUs, or GAUDI, or Cerebras chips. However, the one thing that is common between both of these approaches is the need to enhance machine learning and deep learning frameworks. For example, let's say you want to train your deep neural network on multiple GPUs. If you are considering compute unit and the communication unit as a separate entity, you won't get very good performance. Like if you are training it on multiple GPUs, you will need communication. Communication is a necessary evil. So you will need it to synchronize the performance. But if you are treating them as a separate entity, then when you scale it to thousands of GPUs, your communication time will increase so much that you won't see the performance benefit. So that's why you need to improve deep learning frameworks so that you can overlap communication with the computation. Similarly, if you want to use newer architectures and your deep learning framework is not optimized for those architectures, you may not get the best performance. There might be some hardware specific features for matrix matrix multiplication or other types of mathematical operations. And if, you, if your deep learning framework is not using those optimizations and features, you may you will not get a good performance. So that is why we need to improve machine learning and deep learning frameworks to get better performance. So there are several machine learning frameworks and in this slide, we are listing a few of them. So scikit-learn is one of the oldest and uh, most popular machine learning framework out there in the community. It is built using SciPy, NumPy, and Matplotlib. The one of the biggest disadvantage of scikit-learn is that it does not support GPUs. So if you want to train your machine learning algorithm, or if you want to uh, evaluate your machine learning algorithm, you need to do it on the CPUs as it does not uh, have any support for the GPUs. Why this is the case? Because uh, till now, the machine learning algorithms were not that compute intensive. So that's why researchers can easily train their machine learning algorithms on the CPU and they didn't want to use GPUs for that. The another popular machine learning framework is XGBoost, which implements a extreme gradient boosting algorithm from its research. And it has support for the GPUs and it also supports distributed training. So since uh, there is no support like this, there is no popular deep machine learning framework for, ma for machine learning algorithms 
to uh, like uh, so that you can train them on gpus nvidia started coml project and it and the main aim of this project was to accelerate the machine learning algorithms on gpus and it is one of the key component of uh, nvidia's rapids project on the, these are the machine learning algorithm machine learning frameworks however you can still use tensorflow pytorch and other deep learning frameworks to support classical machine learning algorithms like this uh, they provide basic mathematical operations so you can implement your machine learning algorithm using these uh, frameworks and then use all the features of uh, deep learning frameworks so over the time several deep learning frameworks have emerged it all started with theano and cafe so theano and cafe are one of the oldest deep learning frameworks however they are all deprecated the reason is that uh, like they they were from the academia and uh, when they were like in 2007 around 2007 and 2010 these frameworks uh, uh, came into existence theano and cafe however when the industry saw the potential of deep learning they introduced their own frameworks like google tensorflow facebook pytorch and over the time these uh, uh, frameworks became so popular that uh, uh, theano and cafe were deprecated so let's talk about google tensorflow it is one of the most uh, popular and widely used framework which is open sourced by google so before developing the google tensorflow in 2013 google had this belief framework which is uh, which was uh, used by its internal teams like it was not open sourced to the public however the google's ai team was using the disbelief framework to train their deep neural networks so based on the experience gained from the disbelief framework they designed tensorflow it can run on almost all the architectures you can get your hands on be it cpu gpu tpu or mobile it will run on all the architecture it is very portable one of the problem with the tensorflow is that it has gone back and forth for the apis like uh, earlier tensorflow had a 1.x version which uh, used uh, something called lazy execution and the session and estimators so in that api what you will do is you will first define your deep neural networks like uh, from the beginning to the end then you will create a session and run your deep neural network in it so as you can see that uh, this is not a very uh, easy thing to do and most of the people who are working in uh, deep learning area are not really from the computer science they are from the application domain so it was very difficult for them to use tensorflow that's why tensorflow came up with the 2.0 series which is called uh, which used something called eager execution and uh, had a keras model definition library so in the eager execution you can run your deep neural network as you define it so it made the debugging very easy another popular deep learning framework is pytorch so initially the torch was written in lua i am not sure how many of you know lua but uh, big since lua is not a very popular language the adoption was not uh, that widespread so pytorch is the python adaptation of torch and it is gaining a lot of attention in the community there are several contributors behind the pytorch but uh, the biggest support is by the facebook so around 2 or 3 years ago like uh, facebook wanted to jump into deep learning so they uh they supported pytorch but on the other hand they also hired the a phd student who developed cafe so they uh, he started working on the cafe 2 however after some time both pytorch and cafe 2 were merged into the pytorch so the key selling point of the pytorch is the defined by run approach and the ease of expression so before tensorflow like when pytorch came into the existence tensorflow was still using 1.x series so they still had session api and uh, 
the estimators. So they introduced the defined by run approach where you can define your network and run it uh, at the same time. So you can define layer one and run it to check whether you have uh, written it properly or not, which was later adopted by the TensorFlow in its uh, eager execution. So defined by run approach was the key selling point uh, of PyTorch. There are other deep learning frameworks also like uh, Cafe, Keras, Theano, Blocks, Intel, Big DL, and the list keeps growing. So I would like to mention these two deep neural networks, sorry, deep learning frameworks, Livermore Big Artificial Neural Network Toolkit, Elben, and the Destiny from the Amazon. The unique thing about uh, these two deep learning frameworks is that uh, these deep learning frameworks are designed for the distributed training. They are designed for the HPC community. However, all other deep learning frameworks uh, were designed for the single processing element. So that's why they are unique. So there is a report called AI Index. It uh, offers uh, very detailed grants about uh, AI and ML. So there are several interesting trends. However, I took two graphs from it, which were showing the interesting trends about deep learning frameworks. So as you can see that, if you look at the figure one, you can see that TensorFlow by far is the most popular deep learning framework out there. No other deep learning framework is even close to TensorFlow. So that's why the second figure is showing the popularity or the cumulative GitHub stars without the TensorFlow. And here you can see that the, since its introduction, PyTorch is gaining a lot of attention and it has become the, uh, the second most popular deep learning framework. So the dotted line is for the scikit-learn. It is not a deep learning framework. It is a machine learning framework. So there was a article in 2019 by the gradient, which showed that the PyTorch is winning over the TensorFlow in CVPR and ICML conferences. So basically the academia is favoring PyTorch because it is very easy to use and very easy to modify. So if you want to implement your research and if you want to modify the deep learning framework, then PyTorch is a easier to modify compared to TensorFlow. However, the industry is still using TensorFlow. So TensorFlow is very popular in the industry. The reason is that TensorFlow is very portable. It can run on almost all the architectures you can get your hands on, and it has support for uh, industry uh, level users. So that's why TensorFlow is very popular in the industry. So with that, I uh, let's talk about uh, the execution environment, like where you can run these uh, deep learning and machine learning frameworks. So early, uh, since it's uh, in uh, like uh, in 2013, around 2013, Alex Krzyzewski trained a uh, LXNet model and showed the world that the deep learning or the deep neural networks can outperform the traditional machine learning algorithm. And the deep learning revolution was started around that time. So in when he showed that, um, that uh, deep neural networks can actually beat uh, the machine learning algorithms on the bigger data sets like ImageNet, uh, the world is started to moving towards the deep neural networks. At that time also, he used uh, two GPUs to train the deep neural networks. At that time, he implemented uh, uh, the, uh, the distributed strategy by himself. However, today, the parallel training on multiple GPUs is supported by most of the frameworks. However, the distributed training is still upcoming. So what do I mean by the parallel and distributed training? By parallel training, I mean that in a node, we can have multiple GPUs. So if you are within a node and training a, and want to use multiple GPUs, you can do it. This is called the parallel training. So you can run a process on a CPU and that process can coordinate uh, between, the train, uh, between the training on GPU one and GPU two. 
However, if you want to scale out the training, if you want to use more uh, GPUs, then you need to go beyond the node. This is called distributed training. There is a lot of fragmentation in efforts, like uh, we have Horoward, MPI, Nickel, Glue. Don't worry about these terms. I'm going to introduce all of these terms uh, in the second half of the tutorial. So this is about the software. On the hardware side, we have uh, several architectures, like uh, you have Havana, Nirvana. You can run deep neural networks, or you can at least do inference on your smartphones also, like uh, OK Google or Siri. There is a type PX computer that drives NVIDIA self-driving car. And if you want to do the deep learning on the web browser, there is a deeplearn.js. So there are a lot of uh, options and uh, ways to do the uh, training. However, in this tutorial, we are going to focus more on the conventional execution on CPUs and GPUs. So we have all heard that uh, our framework is faster than your framework or my architecture is faster than your architecture. So in order to evaluate the, uh, the performance, we need to do it in a holistic way because the performance depends on the entire execution stack. So if you are not using the correct set of libraries, it will impact the performance and you will not get the correct numbers. So that's why the isolated view of the performance is not very helpful when it comes to machine learning and deep learning workloads, as there are several architecture specific optimizations that need to be developed and properly used. So let's take an example here. So let's say we have uh, different kinds of uh, uh, architectures or the hardware. Uh, we have processors, multi many core uh, processors like uh, Geon, Geon Phi, or the cascade lake uh, processors. On the other hand, we have many core GPUs like uh, Pascal P100, V100, and A100 GPUs. And at the top, we have deep learning applications like image recognition and speech processing. So let me take a concrete example. Suppose you want to train a convolution neural network. So you will implement that uh, model in one of the deep learning framework. It can be a CAF, it can be CAFE, TensorFlow or PyTorch. Within that deep learning framework, there will be different types of layers for the same, like for the convolution layer, there will be different implementations based on the architecture. So there will be a generic convolution layer, which will be using the generic BLAST libraries like OpenBLAST and Atlas. On the other hand, there will be some optimized uh, layers for a specific architecture. For example, if you are doing it on the GPUs, there will be a CODNN optimized convolution layer, which will be using CODNN in the background. So CODNN is a deep neural network uh, toolkit or the library from uh, NVIDIA to accelerate the deep neural network specific operations on NVIDIA GPUs. So if you want to, let's say, if you want to evaluate the performance on CPUs, and if you are not using, so on, for the Intel CPUs, there is a math kernel library by Intel. Like earlier, it was called math kernel library. Then they called it one DNN, and now it is called one API. So like they have uh, improved it and there are other versions. So if you want to evaluate the performance on uh, Intel CPUs, and you are using the generic convolution layer, you will not get good performance because you are not using the optimizations that are in Intel CPUs for the deep neural networks, and you are not correctly implementing those functions. So this will give you a very bad performance. However, if you want to do it in a correct way, you should use the MKL library or the one API library to do the evaluation. Arpan, there is a there is a question in the chat. Are there yeah, go ahead. are there market market share data for TensorFlow and PyTorch? I think I think the question is more about uh, the usage. What is the kind of usage for TensorFlow and PyTorch from two thousand nineteen uh, to twenty twenty two? Okay. 
so are there market share of data for i'm not aware of any market share data for uh, tensorflow and pytorch however this is a very good question i will try to find it out and we'll get back to you thank you amir or hari do you have any comment on this no arpan okay thank you okay so i am not aware of any such kind of study like where we are doing the market share but i will try to find it out and we'll get back to you yeah thanks sir yeah thank you so now let's talk about the pellar and distributed dnn training so the here is an example of three layer deep neural networks we already know at the high level at the high level dr panda already talked about it but let's go into more detail now so you can consider a deep neural network as a mathematical function which maps the input to the output okay now how it maps it let's see it so it consists of uh, some basic mathematical functions which is denoted by neurons so uh, it will have several neurons and you can think these neurons as a very basic mathematical function so when you give an in input at the input layer you will apply these mathematical function in some order so in this case like uh, you will apply the mathematical functions that are in the layer 1 to that input once you get the output you will apply those uh, mathematical functions in the hidden layer 2 to the to the output and in that way you will do the forward pass so once you reach to the output layer you will get some prediction initially this prediction will be wrong because your deep neural network is not trained for your application so you will compare the prediction with the actual output and will this is called the error and uh, the function we used to compare it is called the loss function so once you get the error you are going to back propagate this error to all the neurons so that you can update those mathematical functions so these mathematical functions are normally same on in every layer however the weights are different like if you if the weights are different so we need to change the weights to train this deep neural network and that's why we are back propagating the error to all the neurons so in this way we do the forward and backward pass in the deep neural network training so back propagation involves a, a very complicated mathematics luckily you don't have to care worry about it because most deep learning frameworks give you a one line implementation like model dot backward so if you just call this one you will get uh, the it will uh, the deep learning framework will do the back propagation for you so now let's talk about uh, the neurons so what do we do inside a neuron what type of mathematical function are we using inside the hidden neuron it is not that complex it is just the linear combination or it is just the weighted summation operation we are doing inside the neuron if you recall weighted summation is a linear operation and uh, no matter how many linear function you stack the output will be the linear so but uh, in real world we have non linear relationship so if we just if we are just using the weighted summation operation the neuron will not be able to map non linear relationship this was called the xor problem so how we solved it it is it can be solved by using the activation functions so after computing the weighted summation we are going to add a non linear function after it so there are different examples of activation functions relu sigmoid 10h relu is a very uh, popular and the most common activation function it is not that uh, hard like relu is just a max function we are where you are taking the max of zero uh, and uh, the output of your uh, neuron so in this way we introduce non linearity into the deep neural networks 
Now, the another essential concept is learning rate. So you can imagine learning rate as uh, the scaling factor by which you are going to uh, increase or decrease the weights. Okay, so or the pace of the learning. So let's say, yeah, this is the error function. On the y-axis, we have the error. And on the x-axis, we have a parameter. So SV, parameter of the weight. So as we change the weight, the error will either increase or decrease. So this is showing a very simple example of uh, that error function. So initially, we will be somewhere here. And we want to reach here. We want to reach to the minimum error. So after doing the backward pass, we will know the direction. Like uh, after, how do we know the direction? By computing the partial differentiation. So I think there is a question. Let me look into it. How should we choose the activation function? Okay, so it depends on the data set and the application you are uh, like uh, it depends on your deep neural network and the data set there are several studies uh, in the literature which has shown that uh, you can find you can use different activation functions and uh, what will be the performance if you use this kind of a of a function for example sorry hello we can hear you we can hear you Okay, I thought someone is trying to speak. Okay, so this is a very good question and uh, activation functions, basically choosing the right activation function depends on the type of your deep neural network and data set. There is no general answer for it. However, I can give some recommendation like you should start with the ReLU function. There are some variants of ReLU function because it doesn't uh, like, uh, if you're training a very, very large model, and uh, the gradients start to diminish after some, after propagating it to the backward layers. So if you don't want to do it, then the ReLU is a very good option. So I hope I answered your question. Now, question pushed, okay. Is there a survey of the most frequently used numerical format and math operators in training or inference? Okay, yeah. So this is a very good question. And uh, I'm not aware of such survey, but I know like uh, one of the most frequently used math operator in uh, deep neural network is matrix matrix multiplication. So most of the operators in deep learning can be translated into the matrix matrix multiplication. Like when you're doing the weighted summation, it can be implemented in the way of matrix matrix multiplication. So I think most of the function is like matrix, either it is matrix, matrix multiplication, matrix addition, or element wise operators in the matrix. So these are the few most frequently used operators in deep learning. Okay, is there any other question? Uh, not at the moment, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, now let's back, now let's get back to the learning weight. Suppose you are here, like you started your training at this point. Now, how will you, like learning rate will determine the size of your step. How long, like uh, how large step you will take. So if the learning rate is too high, you can overshoot and uh, reach to the different end of uh, the error function. And if you do the same thing, then you will reach here. In this way, you will never converge. On the other hand, if the learning rate is too low, you will take very, very small steps towards the minima, and it will take you forever to reach the minima. So that is why we need learning rate to be just right. And the learning rate is one of the hyperparameter in deep neural network training. So it really depends on your uh, model application and the data set there is no answer for it like it, the, there are general guidelines but you cannot uh, say that this learning rate will work for you i will suggest like uh, starting from 10 raised to minus 3 this is uh, a good uh, learning rate to start with
okay i think there is one more question in the chat what is the most frequently used numerical formats okay 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 is it fp32 p float 16 and tf32 or fp8 so there are several studies that have shown that uh, fp16 or uh, the lower floating point operators may be useful because uh, in deep learning we don't really care about uh, the decimal at the 10th position so you can train like uh, in some cases like uh, in most of the cases some people like to use floating point 32 operation however you can decrease it to fp16 to get uh, better to get better performance in terms of training time however like uh, this is regarding the training however in inference mostly uh mostly int 8 int 16 or fp16 operators are used because you don't have to do all of those computations like uh, most of the trained deep neural networks can be quantized to the lower numerical format to decrease the inference time or the latency. Hari, do you want to add anything? Hari? Hari just said that on the chart, it is mostly half precision. FP yes. Yeah, it is mostly half precision, but uh, it depends on your application and uh, other things also. In some cases, people still want to use uh, FP32. However, like uh, the, with the tensor cores and other functionalities, people are moving towards FP16. Okay, now let's go to the next slide or the next essential concept that is the batch size. So let's say you have a data set of uh, hundred images. Let's say you have hundred images. How are you going to train your deep neural network? There are different ways to train it. So there is a one approach called batched gradient descent where you will take all hundred images or the samples, apply the forward and backward pass on it, then update the weights. Another approach is the stochastic gradient descent, where you will take one sample from the data set, apply forward and backward pass, and then update the weights. Both of these approaches have uh, some disadvantages, like, uh, for example, in batched gradient descent, you, you are waiting to process all the samples in the data set to update the weights once. And as we have seen here that you need several steps to reach to the minima. This is a very, very simple example. In reality, you will need like uh, thousands or uh, ten thousands of uh, iterations or the steps to reach uh, the minima. So that's why the batch gradient descent is not uh, very good. On the other hand, the stochastic gradient descent uh, can lead to some noises in the data set. They can lead to some spikes when you are training a model. For example, there will always be the noise in the data set. And if you're just looking at one pixel, one sample, it may direct you to the wrong direction. So, and uh, from the performance point of view also, processing one sample will not give you a very good uh, throughput. The reason is that you are not going to, you won't be able to use all the codes available on the GPU or a CPU. So that's why we have something in the middle called mini batch gradient descent, where you take a subset of data set. So instead of taking only one or all the samples in the data set, you are going to say that, okay, let me take 32 samples from the data set, do the forward and backward pass and then update the weights. So in this way, you are going to average out the, uh, the weight update and apply it to the model. So finding the optimal batch size will give you the fastest learning and uh, 
in practice or in most of the cases, batch size of 64, 128, or up to 8,000, uh, yeah, 8,192 samples per batch size are used. Now, why do we need Peller training? Over the time, the we have larger and deep uh, and deeper models are being proposed. We started with the LXNet, which had only seven layers. Now we are at uh, the Amoeba Net, which has thousands of the layers. Because of uh, these many layers, uh, deep neural networks now require a lot of memory and a lot of computation. Most of the state-of-the-art models cannot even fit inside the memory of a single GPU, like GPT-3 uh, model or the Amoeba Net. So that's why the single GPU training cannot keep up with the ever larger model. So the community has moved to the multi-GPU training. But as we all know that there is a limit, like multi-GPU is within a one node. It, and there is a limit to the scale up. You cannot go beyond eight or 16 GPUs. So that's why we need multi-node or the distributed training for the state-of-the-art models. So now let's talk about, okay, there is a question. Yeah, this is good. Please ask questions. How do you decide the best batch size? Okay. Okay. So deciding the bed, uh, deciding the bed size depends on uh, the architecture and uh, the model. So, like uh, if you increase the bed size, your throughput will increase. But in some cases, the researchers have found that it is harder to train the model with the larger bed size. Earlier, actually, I'm going to answer this question in the uh next few slides so please hold on for some time i will answer this question so let me just go over this slide and then there there is one slide where i'm going to answer this question so let's say so in let's see what is the impact of model size and the data size so larger model leads to the better accuracy and the more data also leads to the better accuracy however when should you use distributed training if you if you don't have enough data and the model size is also less you don't have billions of parameters or you don't have millions of parameters you can just train it on on a single machine you don't need distributed training for it for example if you are training a linet model on a, Cypher data set. You can just do it on your uh, single machine. You don't need a distributed training to train a seven layer model or a six layer model on uh, 60,000 samples. On the other hand, if the data size is very large, for example, the ImageNet data set, which has like, excuse me, 1 million images. And if you want to train a model like uh, ResNet 50 or ResNet 110, which has like 50 or 100 layers, then you will need distributed training. So in all other cases, you will end up in overfitting and underfitting. So what are these things? Let's talk about them. So here we are showing an example of the crane or the an example of the data set. So on the x-axis, we have uh, the feature and on the y-axis we have the output and if you try if you want to train a model to predict this train like if you uh, you can see that this is a second order poly polynomial train however if you are if you're trying to fit a linear model into this one this will lead to underfitting now the model is not complex enough to uh, to map this train if you use a higher degree polynomial like n x raised to 7 or x raised to 8, you will end up mapping the noise also. Like this is the noise and the, the general trend is this one. So this model will be very good on your training data set. However, when it comes to the testing data set, its accuracy will be very bad. So that's why uh, like a, you will go into the overfitting regime. So that's why we want the model to be just right. You don't want to use uh, 
like uh, if your if your data set is not large enough and if you are using a very very large model it will overfit and if your data set is very large and your model is very small like you have only one or two layer model it will it will not be able to map that relationship so that is why we need uh, the model and the data set to be just right now let's see what is the impact of large batch size so as i said earlier like uh, increasing the batch size will give you a better throughput however like uh, it is shown in the community that uh, the bad the large batch size is bad for the accuracy so as you can see that uh, like uh, this is the validation error so higher is uh, uh, so the lower is better so you can see that uh, up to 8k or the 4k batch size you won't see any problem on the training side so now in this case you can go up to 8k batch size to train your model however when you increase it beyond 8k like 32k or 64k when you try to use those batch sizes you the accuracy will degrade these numbers may vary for your model like uh, if a model is small mostly like uh, larger batch size will not give you a very good accuracy so it will be somewhere here however it is safe to use up to 8k batch size in on most of the models so however like uh, this is a very old figure from a, from a paper published by the facebook now we are able to train the imagenet uh, like resnet 50 model on imagenet data set on up to 64 or 128k batch size with some like you have to apply some techniques to make it trainable on such large batch sizes so here we are showing that uh, if you increase the number of gpus the training time will decrease but up to some extent because of this problem of uh, large batch size so the large batch size is good for speed but uh, it is bad for accuracy did i answer your question or do you need uh, more clarification let me check it yeah that's right um serial process of data set can you please tell me what do you mean by the serial processing of data set um can you please clarify your question it would be great so i will as, get as if there is a single processor or a single gpu yeah that's right um but it also so so batch size basically comes in when there are multiple gpus or multiple processes involved so batch size is going to dictate how much work each parallel process or gpu has so so batch size is one level of parallelism another level of parallelism is how many total number of processes or gpus are involved so they they will be working in parallel but you know uh, each one of them will be um, essentially processing a single batch uh, single batch or a single image if the batch size is one okay thank thanks amit okay so now let's jump to the polarization strategy how can we distribute the training of deep neural networks to multiple machines broadly distributed training can be divided into three categories one is data parallelism let me change my pointer okay one is data parallelism second one is the model parallelism and third one is hybrid parallelism which is a combination of model and data parallelism so in data parallelism we distribute the data among the gpus as the amir said earlier like uh, uh, if you have like 32 samples uh, you are going to give eight samples to machine 1 next eight samples to machine 2 and so on in model parallelism we distribute the model itself hybrid parallelism is the combination of uh, data and model parallelism i think there is one more question let me get back to it 
okay it is not a question so okay so we are going to discuss uh, model and uh, hybrid parallelism in the later half of this tutorial but let's discuss about uh, data parallelism so in data parallelism we replicate the model or we copy the model to all the gpus so let's consider a, let's take an example here we have four gpus okay we have four gpus so first we are going to copy the model to all four gpus so we are just copying it we are just replicating the model so the gpu 0 will have the same parameters as gpu 1 2 and 3 okay so these are the models we have on all four gpus and let's say we want to train this model with 128 batch size okay so since we want to train this model with 128 batch size and we have four gpus we are going to divide the batch size the a batch of data among these four gpus so first 32 samples will go to gpu 0 next 32 samples will go to gpu 1 and so on so now we have we have divided the batch bit among uh, all of these gpus all of these gpus will do the forward and the backward pass simultaneously so the gpu 0 will do the forward and backward pass on the first 32 samples gpu 1 will do the forward and backward pass on uh, the next 32 samples and so on so we, these are uh, these operations or these uh, uh, forward and backward passes are happening simultaneously at the end we will have local gradients so the local gradients are used to update the weights we cannot update the weights now because these local gradients are different on each gpu so that's why we need some kind of communication to synchronize the training and that operation is mpi all reduce which basically uh, take the average of which is a, like a element wise av element wise average operation so it will take the average and make the output available to all the gpus so after that, after this operation, we will have global gradients and these global gradients are same on all the GPUs. So we will use these global gradients of, to update the parameters on all the GPUs simultaneously. And this is the one iteration of training. So this is how, how we do data parallelism. Any question on data parallelism? This is one of the most common and widely used technique to distribute the training the, basically this is the go-to technique for distributed training any question on this one if not let me hand it over to dr shafi and he will talk about distributed machine learning algorithms is there a question okay uh, I mean, there is a question. Let me take it. So, hi, Arpan. Do the latest GPUs or driver use RDMA in all radios and broadcast in computing and updating the or does it require CPU involvement? Okay, this is a very good question. So, basically, sorry, are you going? Okay, yeah. So, it depends on the communication runtime. For example, in MR pitch to GDR, we have different kinds of algorithm which may or may not involve the CPU. So, Hari, do you want to answer this question for the all reduce? So, Arpan, as you as you said, it's it's basically dependent on um, you know the communication library. So, um, yeah, Hari, please, if you want to add something. Uh, yeah, no, um, that's right. That, that, that's fine. Also, yes. Yeah. So basically, it depends on the communication runtime and uh, whether it uses RDMA in all reduce or not. It depends on it. So we are we are just going to call that operator from the communication runtime. Go ahead, Amit. 
Is there, uh, I think I see a couple of more questions. Um, so, okay, yeah, there is, okay, this is a very good question. So during the all reduce operation, are the GPUs idle? Okay, can you go back one slide, Amir, please? Thank you. So in distributed data panel training, we try to overlap the all reduce operation with the computation. How do we do it? So recall that uh, back propagation is a sequential process. First, you will do the back propagation on the last layer. Then, for example, let's say you have 100 layer model. You will do it on the layer 100, then layer 99, layer 98, and so on. So, after doing back propagation on layer 100, you can reduce the gradients for that layer. While do a, while do a, while you are doing the back propagation on layer 99. So in this way, we overlap the communication and computation in data parallel training. So that's right. We are not only a slight uh, uh, note here, like uh, we are not communicating the parameters here. We are communicating the gradients. So we compute the gradients and then we reduce those gradients. After reducing the gradients, we update the parameters. So the gradients are the quantity by which we are going to uh, update the parameters. So we are communicating the gradients, not the parameters. However, the size of the gradients is equal to the number of parameters in that layer. Does it make sense? Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Ahmed. So, okay, so thank you, Arpan. Um, so the next section that you know we are going to talk about is uh, distributed machine learning algorithms. So, so far, we have been focusing on neural networks and how can we parallelize them, what are uh, the different options available. But in the context of classical machine learning algorithms, um, in this section and you know going forward in the tutorial, we will also review um, if you're doing, let's say, classic machine learning um, um, processing, then what are the options available? So um, in this case, I would just like to review this one classic um, machine learning algorithm that I think all of us might have seen. Um, K means essentially um, the right-hand side uh, figure is basically displaying uh, 2D points. They are basically scattered in a 2D space. And the idea here is that we would like to classify these points into clusters, right? So in K means we would initiate, when the algorithm basically starts, we are typically given how many clusters do we want to find in this, uh, in, in this you know, our input data. Um, so in this particular case, we are trying to locate um, the value of K is three. So we are trying to identify three clusters. Uh, and as you can see, the way this algorithm works is that we initially, uh, we first of all, as a step zero, we initialize centroids. So centroids are basically the centers of the clusters that we are trying to find. And the, the diamond shape here, which are actually moving in this GIF image are the, those uh, centroids. And um, so the second thing then is because in this particular case, we are thinking about doing this computation in parallel. So we need to divide, divide the space uh, into for multiple processors. So the next step is that, you know, we'll divide the data and one of the approach can be that we simply divide or distribute the elements amongst the GPUs. Um, and then the second, the, the, the step two here is basically assign um, elements. So basically in the, this is basically, you know, the result of the computation. So in each computation, you are going to calculate what's the, if, if, you, are a, if you are a data point, then I would try to find out what's the nearest centroid and then I would, essentially start belonging to that particular um, centroid. Uh, as a step three, um, we basically compute the local cluster mean because as, as a result of step two, the, the assignments of data points to clusters would emerge, it would change. Uh, and as a result of that, we will actually have new cluster means that we compute in step three. And this is basically a local operation. But I mean, if this is distributed K means going on, then you know local computation somehow needs to be aggregated. Uh, and that's what we do in step four. And in this case, we utilize 
an or reduce operation. And K means essentially keeps on, you know, it keeps on running uh, from step two to four until we reach convergence. And convergence here basically means that, you know, we have reached the centroids essentially are not moving any further. So that basically tells us that, you know, each of the random centroid that we started with has now stabilized and we have actually found, you know, first of all, we have found our clusters and we have also found the means of those clusters. So if we um, look, another way to look at this computation is as follows. So we have a set of input elements. Uh, we basically divide those into the number of processing elements. In this case, we are thinking about GPUs. So we divide them amongst the GPUs that we have. Uh, we assign all local elements to the cluster with the closest mean. So, you know, whatever particle, let's say GPU zero or GPU one has, um, you know, it will be assigned to whatever, who, whoever is the, or whatever is the nearest cluster. We perform the local cluster mean operations. So, which is step three here. Uh, and after that, we basically need to share our local cluster computations data with all the other processors involved. Um, and th this is where we basically utilize an all reduce um, operation. So K means is supposed to be very scalable operation because the data set, the, the input data is not moving at all. The only piece of information that we are actually sharing as part of this all reduce is the cluster mean. And if the cluster mean is let's say K equals to three, or, you know, uh, in that case, we might just be, you know, communicating you know the the location of these centroids with all the other processes which is not going to be large amounts of data um so moving on um this slide is just showing the 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 uh, algorithm again uh, as figure but here i would like to focus on the results here right so in this case we see that on the y axis we have increasing number of mpi cores and on the y axis we have the computational time. So as the number of MPI cores are being added or processing cores are being added, we would expect that, you know, the execution time or the computational time would come down. And we actually see that um, the three curves here are representing different dimensions. I mean, in this particular case, we are only thinking about a 2D problem, but in real world, the problems are not that simple and the dimensions could be, you know, uh, many, uh, many more. So in this case, the blue line is, is representing 32 dimensions. The red line is 64 and the green line is 128. And as you can see that as, you know, we are increasing the processing cores, uh, essentially each of the solution is actually scaling. And this is actually close to linear speed up. So if you are doing, let's say K means today, uh, I mean, you don't want to go and rewrite the whole thing from scratch and do MPI or reduce and all of that. So what kind of support is available there if you're trying to do distributed machine learning today? So Arpan has covered almost all of these, um, but here I would just like to point out that scikit-learn is considered the de, de, the de facto standard when it comes to machine learning, the classic machine learning as we know it. Um, and it has support for parallel and distributed computing through an API called Joblet. So it's possible that you know you can run uh, your scikit-learn jobs on a cluster. Um, however, um, Arpan, as Arpan reviewed, scikit-learn does not have support for um, GPU. So XGBoost, uh, which is another um, machine learning library, which is used for gradient boosting algorithms, um, Actually, there are multiple ways to run this on a cluster. So it, it is integrated with Dask, um, Gray, Apache Spark, and AWS Yarn. Um, but the more um, interesting or exciting you know, development in the area of classic machine learning has been the emergence of the QML library, which comes from NVIDIA. So basically, NVIDIA you know, saw this opportunity that there is no uh, classic machine learning um, you know, library available that executes on the CPU, and that's a big gap, right? So if accelerators are good enough for neural networks or, you know, big data or data science, then why can't those be used for classic machine learning? And uh, so uh, NVIDIA has come up with QML, and QML actually integrates well with Dask and NVIDIA's uh, Nickel communication library. So 
So this basically allows you to um, do dis run distributed machine learning algorithms, do you know um, ML training on distributed uh, on essentially distributed processing elements. Um, they, those essentially can be part of the cluster, or um, those can also be let's say on on the cloud. So with this, uh, I've just given you an introduction of distributed machine learning algorithms. Um, the next thing that I would like to talk about and just briefly introduce um, is data science using DASK. Um, so DASK, if you're aware of data science, um, you know, there are currently two very popular technologies out there. One is essentially Apache Spark and second is um, DASK. Um, and Dask, if you're a Python programmer and if you're coming from the Python you know, side of things, then maybe Dask would be your first choice. That's not to say that Spark does not have support for uh, Python, it does. Um, but you know, um, Spark was actually written in the Scala and Java programming language. And originally when it became, when it uh, emerged or when it started, it was targeting Scala and Java programmers, you know, those, the languages that built on top of Java virtual machine. Um, but now recently, obviously they have added support for Python and, you know, but Dask from, you know, the very beginning has been, um, you know, uh, targeting the Python community. Um, and one of the strengths of, you know, Python, uh, sorry, um, Dask is that it scales Python applications from laptops to high-end systems. So you can just write your application on a laptop. The same application is going to scale on a cluster and that's a very powerful feature. Uh, under the hoods, it basically builds a task graph, which is then executed lazily on the parallel hardware. So if you, let's say, if you have a big table that you're trying to process, and let's say you want to find out the contents of a particular column. So Dask is not going to run operations as you define them, right? So it will own, it will sort of aggregate all the operations and only execute them when some kind of result has to be returned to the users. Um, and th this is also an approach which is um, used by Apache Spark. Um, so this, uh, and another one of the key strengths of Dask is that it natively extends popular data processing libraries like NumPy and Pandas. Um, and Dask distributed is one back piece of uh, the puzzle here, which supports parallel and distributed execution. Um, and if you download Dask today, so it will it will come, you know, it it will provide support for TCP and it will also provide support for um, UCX through a library called UCX Pi. So you know you can make use of these um, high performance networks if you utilize um, the UCX communication library. But you know, as the tutorial would go on, we would also talk about something um, uh, which is called MPF for Dask, which is um, an MPI-based communication device that our group has developed. And it's basically, it will let you utilize, you know, MPI communication from within the Dask environment. Um, yes, and as I've, you know, covered that, you know, Spark and uh, actually more recently, this Ray uh, framework is also now catching up and becoming very popular in the Python community as well. So, um, I know there are a few questions, so I'll, I'll just take those after I've covered this particular slide. So, um, so this is the execution model, which is utilized by Dask distributed. Um, so if you're trying to run Dask on a, dis on a cluster or a distributed um, setup, um, so you would basically first try and uh, start something called a Dask cluster. And as part of this, you would basically first go and start a scheduler. Okay, so that's basically the first process which will be start and it's it will act as kind of a master process and after that we go and we start workers one by one right so and workers can be flexible i mean these can be i mean you could work with a single worker you could work with two workers three workers i mean you could depending on your environment you could end up starting n number of workers and these workers would basically as the startup they are provided a url for the scheduler and they will connect with the scheduler and they will essentially be ready for any uh, compute that the user is ready to launch. And when the user is about to launch any computation, they would 
basically do so from the client process. So you, they would start a client process and this client process would then contact the scheduler, which then basically divides the data and let each worker know that, you know, what kind of uh, operations they need to perform. And once they have, once each worker has done their share of the work, they would, you know, get back to scheduler. They can ask for more work or if the job is done, the scheduler is responsible for returning the results back to the client. So th this is basically the, the distributed execution model that DASC follows. And we will go into more detail as we talk more about uh, some of the solutions that our group has developed. Right, so with this, I conclude uh, the distributed machine learning and data science introductory parts. And I would hand it over to my colleague, Dr. Uh, Shubramani. Um, but before that, let me just take these questions. So I am, I, I answered a few questions. Sure. So can, you, so can you please answer this one? This question, let me just phrase it to you. For a fixed data set, can k-mean algorithm determine the best value of k? I mean, it can, so it, it all depends, right? So um, k-means actually known to converge eventually, right? It will converge, but if you're worried about, you know, uh, if you if you're worried about how many computations it should execute for, so basically you could either have, you know, either it converges, you know, the, the centroids do not move anymore, or they move by a very small margin, or, you know, you can also bound this algorithm by the total number of iterations that you can execute. So, so I mean, to answer your um, question, uh, K-means is actually known to converge, and it, 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 it would basically converge, but then there are some more details here as well. It also depends on the data sets, and there are better, you know, clustering algorithms available out there than k-means as well. But, you know, we obviously, because I was just introducing this, so we started with the basic one, which is k-means. So let me just add a few things here. Sure. So k is a hyperparameter for a k-means algorithm. So it requires k to converge to a point. It cannot find the k value automatically However, in the literature, there are few techniques that can be used to find the appropriate value of K. Basically, there are methods like the elbow method or the Shilot method. In most of these methods, we will run K-means algorithm with different value of K on a fixed data set and see that what is the error. And based on the error, we will take the decision like which k value is appropriate for the given data set. Did I answer your question, Tong Lai? I hope I answered your question. So there is one more question. So I'm going, I'm just going to repeat it for the audience. So k means is just targeted for machine learning, not deep learning. Is it right? Right. So basically, k-means, as we, uh, I mean, th this is all kind of, you know, muddled up. Uh, it's very hard to differentiate what is deep learning, machine learning. I mean, it overlaps, but I mean, in classical machine learning, k-means is thought to be, you know, belonging to ML and not DL. When we are talking about DL, we are talking about neural networks, essentially. Yeah. So basically, deep neural networks or the deep learning is a subset of machine learning. So... Machine learning includes all the algorithms that are in deep learning or the classical machine learning algorithms. In deep learning, we only focus on deep neural networks and its variants like convolution neural networks, transformers, or recurrent neural networks. Okay, can you run k-means in GPUs? This is a question on chat, Amit. Right, absolutely. So um, if you're using QML, which is NVIDIA's um, machine learning library, you would, they have k-means implemented. So if you're coding your machine learning algorithm with QML, then obviously you would be using uh, GPUs. There's one more question. Do you want me to phrase it or? You so to... Mingzi's question is very specific to <laughs> Ohio supercomputer. So basically, if you're doing deep learning on that system, no, you are not using DAS. So, you know, you would be 
um, using some kind of MPL library to do all reduce if, if you're doing distributed training. So I'm not sure. Can you please clarify your question also? When we run Python deep learning scripts, what do you mean by deep learning scripts here? Because uh, when we are doing deep learning, we mostly use deep learning frameworks and the task is not a deep learning framework. So if we want to do distributed training on any cluster, it can be Ohio supercomputer, it can be Pittsburgh supercomputer, you use either the TensorFlow, PyTorch, or some other deep learning framework. And uh, for the communication, you will use MRPitch2 or Nickel or any other MPA library. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Arpan. So, uh, Hari, before you begin, um, so can we promote Dr. Parna, please? I don't see him in... Um, unfortunately, only uh, Saurav yeah, is so cool. not responding to... Uh, okay, okay, got it. Okay. So, yeah, Rohit has been trying to, to help with that, but, but Dr. Panda, yeah, I think he, he can't even... So, um, how about this? Uh, it, it, it's about two hours into the uh, tutorial. Let's take a 15-minute uh, bio break. And we can be back at about 6.15 uh, Eastern, 3.15 uh, uh, Pacific. Okay? Okay, sure. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be able to figure out. Yeah. Uh, let me just give a call to Saurav in the meantime. Yeah, if you can do that, that will be good. <laughs> so, for the attendees, we are taking a 15 minutes break, right? So, um, so we'll start again at 6.15 Eastern and 3.15 Pacific. Amir, I have joined uh, as a panelist now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, um, uh, um, I just gave a call to. Okay, uh, okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So we're we're we taking a break. So like like. Yeah. Minutes. But might be after coming back from the break, um, we'll um, have to introduce the the um, hands-on yeah. accounts and all, and then go into the sure. next steps. Yeah. Thank you.
So I think we can start back. It's about 6.15. Yeah. yeah. Um, hi, guys. So we are heading into the second portion of our uh, tutorial. So before we do that, uh, let me uh, show you how the hands-on section of the tutorial is going to work. So uh, please go to slide number 122, 122 uh, on the slide deck. So you would see a link there. If you click on that link, it will take you uh, to this page, okay? Now we would request that you go to this page and pick a username and password by indicating your name against it as uh, Arpan and Amir have done here, okay? So please indicate your name against it. You would use this username and this password to log on to our remote uh, supercomputing system called RI2. So you would uh, use the username obtained from there. You will put it here and use the password and put it here. And uh, that will directly take you uh, to a location, okay? So we, uh, those who are interested in doing the hands-on, I would recommend that they kindly try to log on to this uh, system as they are listening in to the rest of the presentation, okay? So please let us know if you find uh, any issue. So again, you click on this link, it will take you to a Google Docs page, get the username and password from there, use that username and password to log on to the system using your favorite uh, uh, SSH terminal or client, and uh, make sure that uh, you are uh, able to log in. So if you could do that, that would be fantastic, okay? Now with that, let's uh, resume uh, our uh, uh, presentation. So, so far, we have covered the introduction uh, of what deep learning is, machine learning is, why do we need this, the overview of execution environments, so, and so on and so forth. Okay, So now we have an idea as to why do we need to uh, like have high, high performance uh, DNN training. Now, this uh, portion is going to show you the how we can achieve that. Okay, So first, let's start with the latest trends in uh, HPC uh, architectures. Okay, So currently, if you look at... Uh, modern high performance computing systems, they are primarily driven by multi many core process, uh, processors uh, like your AMD Epic or AMD Rome, uh, in, uh, Intel, Cascade Lake, Skylake, those kind of processors. High performance interconnects like InfiniBand, OmniPath, Slingshot, uh, uh, and of course, accelerators. These form the backbone of most um, deep learning, machine learning uh, training uh, processes. And as, as Amir and Arpan mentioned, all of these uh, primarily rely on GPUs. Of course, you have storage. So all of these put together uh, are kind of driving the modern uh, HPC architectures. Now, if you look at it, there are uh, two components to this. Uh, you have hardware as well as the software. So the right hardware without the right software is a complete waste, okay? You will not be able to get the kind of performance that you would like to from that hardware. So we'll cover both aspects here. Uh, hardware architectures and communication middleware or software architectures for distributed deep learning training, okay? Now, what comes under hardware uh, architecture? So broadly, we'll divide it into two components, interconnects and the processors. And our goal is to give you an overview uh, of uh, the various uh, solutions available out there, okay? This is not meant to be an extensive uh, coverage of all available interconnects and processors out there uh, in the uh, wide world. This is just going to give you a flavor of what is out there so that you can appreciate uh, uh, the rest of the tutorial. Now, there are various high performance interconnects like InfiniBand, OmniPath, Slingshot, uh, as I described, okay? Now, what makes an interconnect or how can, what are the features of an interconnect that makes it high performance? So obviously low latency and high bandwidth are no brainers, but you have, a third parameter called low CPU overhead. So why is this so important? Now, if you think about it, any application developer would want an interconnect with zero latency and infinite bandwidth, okay? So an application developer only wants to do compute. Communication is something that they are forced to do, not something that they want to do, okay? Now, if on top of that, you say that if you want to do communication, you have to give me like 20% of your CPU, then they are not going to be very happy with that. Now, that is one of the primary reasons why low CPU overhead for progressing communication is a critical uh, feature of high performance interconnects. Okay? Now, if you look, take a look at one popular high performance interconnect like InfiniBand, you, this graph kind of shows you how the speeds have evolved over the last 20 years. So we started with single data rate and double data, data rate, like 10 and 20 uh, gigabits per second. 
And right now we are at NDR or 400 gigabits per second, okay? And uh, next generation interconnects are already uh, in, the, uh, in the pipeline and they would be coming out soon, okay? Now, this is like uh, all we are going to discuss in this tutorial about uh, uh, high performance networks. Uh, much more details were given in the morning version of the tutorial. Now let's take a brief look at on the CPU side or the processing side. So if you take a look at it, there are lots of custom uh, CPUs or custom processors for uh, training. One such uh, example is the tensor processing unit or TPUs from Google. So if you log on to Google Cloud, you should be able to get one of these and you have TensorFlow, which has already been um, tailor-made to run on uh, the Google Cloud with TPUs. So all of these things you can try out right now if you uh, go on to uh, cloud-based systems, okay? And uh, this is a SIST-style instruction set, and it uses systolic arrays as the heart of the multiply unit. Now, there are other uh, architectures out there. So this is uh, called an IPU or an intelligence processing unit from a company called GraphCore. So these uh, slides are, are a little outdated, but still they are uh, a player in the market. That's why they are, we are highlighting it here. So when these were released several years ago, uh, their solutions were outperforming the uh, NVIDIA's GPUs by a significant factor. So again, these needs to be replotted, but again, these are vendor numbers. We have not played with this ourselves. And if you want to play with it, these uh, graph core IPUs are available on uh, Microsoft Azure IPU instances, okay? The other... Um, one that is coming up is uh, the Gaudi processor from a company called Habana Labs. So Habana Labs was acquired by Intel for a whopping $2 billion uh, a few years ago. So this has a uh, high performance compute as well as a, a high performance interconnect integrated on the chipset itself. And based on their uh, performance numbers, they were able to outperform the Volta series of GPUs from Intel by a significant factor as is shown in these uh, graphs. This is the uh, latest kid on the block, uh, so to speak. Um, Cerebras uh, has uh, come up with their, what is called as uh, wafer scale engine or WSC. It's a huge, um, let's say chip, okay? And uh, they uh, more or less uh, uh, built in the communication fabric on the chip itself. So it has a 2D mesh, com a mesh communication fabric with almost 100 petabytes per second of communication bandwidth, okay? Uh, it, it has seven nanometer form factor and uh, a significant 2.6 trillion uh, chips, okay? So this is more or less a supercomputer in a box. Again, these are also available uh, at various centers. For instance, the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center has uh, two of these. They have their own version of TensorFlow uh, built for their uh, architecture uh, and built for their uh, communication uh, infrastructure. So again, if you want to try these things out, they are available for you. You just need to uh, go and ask the right set of people for access. Uh, so I hope that gives you a flavor of the hardware side, okay? Now, the hardware is completely useless without the appropriate software. So now let's take a look at the different uh, parallel programming models, which are available for you to take advantage of these things. Now, broadly, at a high level, you can classify parallel programming models into three. One is the standard shared memory model, which we all grew up uh, uh, learning to program. So the processes have the, uh, have the same view of the physical shared memory and they can access the resources without any issues. However, while it is simple, this has scalability limitations. So that is why people came up with what is called as a distributed memory model, where the processes know that they are uh, on physically separate uh, compute elements and they have to exchange messages in order to uh, communicate, okay, explicitly exchange messages. So this is the distributed memory model and the message passing interface or MPI is the most popular, uh, let's say implementation of this distributed memory model. So while this is extremely scalable, it has some inherent uh, productivity issues because you have to write a lot more programs. So that's where people came up with this concept of partitioned global address space or PGAS models, okay? So PGAS models, while uh, being implemented on an inherently distributed uh, architecture, they give a logical shared memory view to the processes so that the complexity of sending messages, receiving messages is completely hidden from the application developer. So this is kind of a middle ground. So all of these are uh, mo uh, what modern programming models do. 
So there was a question about uh, uh, like already uh, previously, right? So if your interest is distributed data parallel deep learning, then this is the one and only collective that you really need. Okay. And already is used uh, at the end of each epoch of training to aggregate the gradient. So basically to uh, pool in your knowledge and learn from each other, so to speak. Okay. So this is the one and only collective operation that you have to optimize if you are interested in distributed data parallel deep learning training. Okay. Now there are different implementations of all reduce uh, by various uh, uh, vendors. So one such implementation uh, is in the MBAPH MPI library, which is uh, something that we have been developing in our lab for the last 21 years. It is a very popular implementation used uh, uh, all across the world by various organizations. For more details, please visit our website. Now, by now we know that uh, GPUs are an essential uh, component of your deep learning or machine learning compute pipeline. Okay. Now, any communication middleware that does not address the GPU as a first class citizen is going to be in trouble. So that is why we came up with the concept of CUDA aware communication runtime about uh, 10 years ago. Okay. So what is a CUDA aware communication library? If you look at the typical modus app operandi for using um, the GPUs, it's like CUDA memcopy host to device, uh, do your compute, CUDA memcopy device to host, send to your remote process, then do the same on the remote side. But what if you could provide the device buffer, the buffer resident on the GPU directly to a communication runtime, and it can take care of the transfers for you as is shown in the animation. Now you would say, what's the big deal? The big deal is that this path from uh, one GPU to another GPU is incredibly complex. Okay, On modern systems, there are up to 16 different paths to go from one GPU to another GPU, depending on the relative locations of the GPU and the HCA, the GPU and the CPU, the CPU and the HCA, uh, and uh, uh, whether you're going intra or inter -node, the kind of communication libraries available to you, so on and so forth. So if you force an application developer to learn all of these things, it will be a significant overhead for them. So that is why in our communication runtime, we have hidden this uh, complexity inside so that the application developer can just pass a device buffer and get high performance with high productivity. Okay. So what high performance am I talking about? So this is the kind of benefits that you get if you have a properly optimized CUDA aware communication runtime available for you to move data from one node to the other. So you get close to uh, 10, uh, 10 times improvement in your communication performance, which is significantly valuable if you want to scale out to a large number of compute elements. Now, MPI is not the only solution. So MPI is a very generic solution. It's very portable. If you write your code for MPI, then it can run on almost any supercomputing system in the world. Okay. However, if you think that, okay, no, MPA is too complex for me. I don't want to figure out how to do all of that. I want something very simple. I am only going to use uh, like NVIDIA GPUs and I, I, I'm married to an NVIDIA ecosystem. What is, the, what is the simplest solution for me? So that is why NVIDIA created what is called as the NVIDIA's Collective Communication Library or NICL for short, okay? Now there are different versions of NICL uh, and for more details, uh, you, you can visit the NICL's website. But as part of this, let me at a high level tell you that Nickel is capable of supporting different collectives as well as point-to-point -point operations for multi-node, multi-GPU systems. Okay. So again, this has gone over uh, several, uh, let's say, avatars or several uh, like evolutionary steps. So right now we are at about Nickel 2.12. It has support for like point-to-point -point operations, collective operations, so on and so forth. So if you think that, no, I don't want to learn a new programming model like MPA, I don't want to uh, like handle the complexity, let me just take care of this for my particular use case, then maybe Nickel could be a solution for you, okay? So with this, we kind of come to the end of the uh, section where we talk about the latest trends in HPC architectures, and I'll hand over to Dr. Panda to discuss the next section. In the meantime, um, uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, it's in a windowed mode. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, um, okay. Um, are there any other questions so far? No. Okay. 
so so now if you see i mean we we got exposed to the, all the basic uh, concepts of um, machine learning deep learning dask we also took a look at the hpc computing architecture now let's try to put them together but before you go together let's see what will be the challenges okay so the broad challenge is to how to exploit this hpc all the latest trends whatever we discussed now for all these newer frameworks and and in a concise manner we can basically say how to efficiently scale out um, so there are two concepts here like a um, uh, scale up and scale out i think these are standard terminology that means scale up is within a node if i keep on adding more more cpus more gpus um, people have been making progress um, but maximum you can put let's say eight gpus or sometimes even maximum most of the time it is like a one or two there are modern servers available with four and eight but then that is not good enough question is now can i really scale scale out like a 5000 nodes with uh, uh, with with eight gpus it's like a 40000 gpus so so there the question is okay how do we take advantage of these heterogeneous computing resources the cpu gpus tpu uh, for the kind of the frameworks what we talked about machine learning deep learning data science so the, there is of course a lot of r and d is taking place along these directions i'll try to categorize them into four different directions okay so and then we'll take some solutions and then you will be able to exactly see how each solution fits into um, each of these domains the first one is like if you take a look at this picture we introduced earlier we have the deep learning machine learning framework here this could be like cafe cafe 2 tensorflow pytorch mxnet uh, your favorite machine learning framework or deep learning framework of course the end application sits on top of it but now if you take a look at like those of you are familiar with HPC system, let's say I'm trying to run a weather forecasting model or I'm trying to run a bioinformatics uh, uh, application. Each of these applications or each of those models have certain like a memory requirements, computational requirements, communication overhead. And a lot of people keep on optimizing all those things for every architecture. Okay? Like let's say Fugaku has a certain topology with a certain kind of um, communication characteristic, so they try to match it. Similarly, let's say the frontier machine is coming up, a lot of applications will get optimized there. So now we can think of instead of the end applications, now we need to worry about these frameworks themselves. Because the frameworks themselves, like if you take a PyTorch or TensorFlow, you have to optimize some of the communications there. And that and these frameworks also have memory requirements. So so this is where we need to see how best to take care of the model propagation stay, forward stay, backward stay, gradient aggregation. So if we can optimize those, then those optimization will get translated to the end application. This is like the category one um, set of challenges and solutions. And once we know that, then the question is like, a, how do we overcome the limits of the single node training? I mentioned about the like the scale up and scale out. So scale up is okay. Of course, there are challenges within the node, how to take advantage of all the CPU, GPUs, network. We want to keep them busy all the time. But then the question is, how do I take it out if, if you have hundreds of thousands of these? So this is where the bigger challenge is, how do you design this communication runtime, especially for distributed training or distributed machine learning? So that's like category two. Then below that, you will see which is the category three. Inside that communication runtime, what new mechanisms or new solutions do we provide? Okay, a um, few slides back, um, Hari introduced this CUDA aware MPI, MPI. So that means if, if I take some data to the GPU and perform the operation, the results are there, I need not take it back to the memory and then send it out to other GPUs. I can directly send it to the from the GPU to the other GPU. So that is like a CUDA awareness. Now then in that using that CUDA awareness, I have to optimize both point to point and collectives. And especially collectives, you saw the, uh, like some of the examples earlier, like a lot of deep learning, machine learning have already used. Uh, that has been the traditional one. Uh, nowadays, a lot of uh, models like a, a deep speed and all are trying to utilize all to all, um, broadcast, a lot of newer collectives are also being used. The bigger difference is collectives are not new. Those who are familiar with MPI, you will see the collectives have been there for 30 years, almost the beginning of the MPI standard. But the difference are that in the scientific applications, most of the time you will see these applications are also iterative in nature. But in the end, you are looking only for, let's say, all reduce of only eight bytes or four bytes, very small messages. But on the other hand, this deep learning, as we are trying to do this aggregation, these messages can be huge. 
it could be in four megabytes or four gigabytes. So the question is, how do you design the collectives for that large message space? So this is where a lot of actions are taking place for the last several years, a lot of groups, even the companies like the Nickel, everybody's trying to optimize those. So this is where either you go through an API level solution, Nickel level solution, earlier we had a Glue, MLSL. So a lot of effort is going on in, in this context to have large collective communication and CUDA awareness. And then the final thing comes with the co-designing. And, and co-designing is nothing new, it has been there. Uh, just like in the scientific communication, let's say I have some application, that application is using a runtime, that runtime is using some um, uh, underlying uh, hardware software, it has some mechanisms. And if we can make some changes, instead of doing a layer design, can we actually make some changes at one layer and then keep on propagating it to the upper layers? And exactly same things are also happening here. So that means we take it, the frameworks, the runtime and the features on the uh, on the on the network and the adapter and the accelerators, and then try to put them together to, to see whether we can even deliver better performance. So that is kind of the fourth uh, kind of directions. So we'll take a look at the, in the next section, we'll take a look at a lot of solutions, and then exactly we'll see which solution belongs to which of these four categories. So I'll uh, hand it over to um, um, Arpan now, uh, but before that, if there are any questions on the chat, or on Slack, um, we'll be very happy to, to to answer it. Any questions? Okay. Uh, if not, Arpan, um, let's let's proceed. Yeah, sure, Doctor Panda. I hope you can see my screen. I'm sharing slides now. Yes, Arpan. Doctor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. So now let's talk about uh, deep learning solutions and uh, how we can solve some of the challenges as discussed by the Dr. Panda when it comes to uh, combining HPC and deep learning or accelerating the deep learning using HPC resources. So I have divided these case studies and solutions into two broad categories. The first one is data parallelism, and then we are going to discuss model and hybrid parallelism. As data parallelism is uh, very popular, so we are going to go into more detail. So let's talk about the first solution that is NVIDIA's, NVIDIA, NVIDIA's Nickel or Nickel 2. So, this is a very popular graph, which was shown in one of the GTC in 2017. So here they are showing why nickel is necessary. So they did the distributed training with the ResNet 50 using CNTK and tried to scale out the training to 32 GPUs. So let me describe this figure first. On the X axis, we have number of GPUs and on the y-axis, we have images per second. It means like how many images are we able to process per second on those GPUs? So as you can see that, like uh, this was a system which has eight GPUs per node. So you can see that uh, if we are using eight GPUs, we are getting eight times the performance of a single GPU. So this is good. Here, the dotted line represents the ideal solution or the ideal speed up. The green one is nickel and the black one is MPI. As you scale out and go beyond a node, you can see that MPI performance is not as good as it should be. Like it is very far away from the ideal line. So that's why they said like we need nickel to get the ideal performance that is uh, here represented by the dotted line. And uh, you can see that Nickel is uh, giving that kind of a performance. So what's the reason? What is the reason by MPI is lagging behind the Nickel? At that time, when uh, like in 2017, distributed training was coming up. And at that time, the data pallet training was uh, one of the most popular technique to distribute the training. So, however, the MPI libraries were not optimized for the 
large masses collective. So in distributed deep neural network training, we use all reduce operation and that all reduce operation is on very large message size. And as Dr. Panda mentioned that uh, in, in HPC community, we have a very small message size collective operations. It can be eight byte, 16 byte or 128 byte. In some cases, one MB. But most of uh, the most of these operations will be below one MB. So MPI libraries were not optimized for large message collectives. And Nickel optimized those uh, uh, message ranges and got the better performance. So here is the performance evaluation of MRPS2 GDR, which is a MPI library for uh, the GPUs and the Nickel 2 with uh, for the all reduce operation. So as you can see here, like uh, for the small message ranges, nickel is not doing good and they don't have to because the nickel primary user is deep neural network training or the distributed training. So in the and uh, in data pallet training, we don't have a small messages. So they don't have to do good. They're the only thing that they need to optimize is the large message collectives. So, so you can see that uh, MPI library like uh, MRPH2 is performing very good when it comes to the uh, small messages. But uh, now since we have uh, optimized uh, MRPH2 GDR for the large message collective also, we are performing on par with uh, the nickel. So now what kind of uh, performance you can expect uh, from MPI and nickel libraries when it comes to the distributed training. So in this uh, small survey, we are going to show you numbers for the TensorFlow and PyTorch for the nickel, for both the uh, MPI and nickel that are using large message collectives. So we are going to show numbers for both CPU and GPU. So let me take a step back. I think there is a question on the chat, let me quickly answer that one. Okay, so the question is, in the first graph on page 77, why does MPI scale okay from 16 to 32? So let me get back to that slide. Okay, from 16 to 32. Okay. Um, let me read the question again. Why does MPI scale okay from 16 to 32? Yeah, I mean, so in other <laughs> words, why is MPI doing bad compared to nickel? Okay, why it is doing bad? Um, Because it is not optimized for the large message collectives. So if you look at this one, it is going outside the node. So, okay from eight to 16, we are going outside the node. So that's why the, we are not seeing that much performance benefit. Now there is a high increase in the communication latency when going from the eight to 16. Now we are outside the node. So that uh, now that uh, overhead is not that much. So that's why we are scaling kind of okay from 16 to 32. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think um, we should also, this is 2017, okay, five years back. So we are starting with a little bit of historical perspective. In the next few slides, we will see that MPI and nickel are almost similar, even yeah. sometimes MPI is doing better than nickel, okay? Yeah, so as you can see in this slide, now that graph is from 2017. This is, these are the latest numbers that are taken on OSC picture system for MPI already use operation. And you can see that MPI libraries are now on par with the nickel when it comes to large message collectives. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a question? One second. So isn't GDR also optimized for small message sizes? Why MPI plus GDR can compete with the nickel when it's get uh, larger size. Okay, maybe Dr. Panda or Hari can answer this question. So, uh, the, uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, we are trying to show you uh, the, the evolution of uh, libraries across five years. 
as things stand now yes gdr and uh, nickel do compete with each other and it can outperform okay but uh, what we were trying to show you previously was historical uh, data when people had not realized that oh yeah the uh, the mpa developers had not realized that oh no uh, like these uh, um, deep learning frameworks are using 128 uh, megabyte messages and MPA library has not been done, uh, like, eva like uh, evaluated or optimized for that. We have solutions. It's just that they were not being used. So simply when the Horowat solution first came out, or uh, the Baidu's uh, already first came out, all they were doing is a ring-based already. MPA had done that about 20 years ago. It is just that the libraries which were being used by the deep learning people who did not know, know MPI were not tuned for it. That's about it. So yes, they can compete. You are just trying to show you a historical perspective of how things were and how things are. So this slide shows you how things are. Okay. So the next question is, the large messes were due to large number of weights that needs to be updated. That's right. So in deep learning, in most of the deep distributed deep learning frameworks, we update the weights or we do the all reduce operation layer wise. Okay. And these layers have large number of parameters. So that's why the all reduce uh, operation size is very large. However, there are some techniques in distributed uh, deep learning middlewares like Horovod, which uh, combines uh, some layers parameters to make sure that the all reduce operation is large so that instead of launching multiple all reduce operation and incurring the cost or the overhead of launching multiple all reduce operations we only launch one big all reduce operation but that is uh, only used when we have very very small layers and uh, okay <clears throat> Concatenate multiple layers. Yes, that's like horror word is con it is not concatenating multiple layers. It is just concatenating, it is just calling all reduce operation when it has gradients for multiple layers and then concatenating that data buffer into one. So this is how it is doing it. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. So now let's move to the next uh, slide if there are uh, if there are not any question okay so now let's talk about after seeing this kind of a performance like now uh, now we see that uh, uh, mpi libraries can compete with the nickel they can uh, provide better performance sometimes or uh, uh, they can outperform the nickel now let's see what are the end to end numbers okay so we did some evaluation for the distributed training for both PyTorch and TensorFlow on both CPU and GPU. So now let's see the numbers. So before going to that evaluation, let me just talk about the data parallel training with TensorFlow and a little bit of history. Okay. So the so when the distributed training, uh, like when researchers started using distributed training, there were a lot of options available. So when it comes to TensorFlow, it initially tried to push gRPC-based solution. gRPC is a communication protocol or runtime from uh, Google. So they tried to use their own solution. However, the problem with the gRPC was that it was not very good in large message collectives as we have seen in the previous slide that the large masses collective performance can impact your performance. So people started working on this and the researchers proposed accelerated gRPC. The other direction was like, uh, we will use gRPC for the bootstrapping and starting the distributed training. But for the actual communication, we will use some other communication runtime. That's why the solutions like uh, gRPC plus MPI, gRPC plus verbs or gRPC with GDR were proposed. And then there was a, a one more community which said, okay, I don't want to use gRPC. I want to implement my own uh, solution. So they 
practice is called no gRPC. So basically the Baidu MPI from the Baidu, they like uh, when they started doing all of these things, the distributed training, they proposed their own uh, solution for all reduce operation to make it fast. The another one, which is uh, very popular right now is Horoword. So Horoword is uh, like a go-to distributed deep learning middleware for the data pilot training nowadays. Okay. So Horoword said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement the distributed data pilot training support in multiple deep learning frameworks. And I'm going, I'm not going to just uh, use one communication runtime. I'm going to provide options for multiple communication runtimes to the user so that they can select whatever they want. So they have MPI support, nickel support, glue support, DDL support, and other communication runtime support. So if you want to, let's say use MRPH2 GDR and want to do the distributed training with it. So you can use Horoword and configure it with the MRPH2 MPI library and do the distributed training. If you want to do nickel, if you want to use nickel, then you can configure Horoword with the nickel. So it is that easy now. So that's why we are from our lab, we are proposing the MRPH2 or the MPI driven infrastructure for MLDL training. So if you want to do data pilot training, you can just use Horoword. It supports TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet, and other deep learning frameworks. If you want to do it on CPU, you can use MRPH2 X. And if you want to do it on GPUs, then you can use MRPH2 GDR. We also support other uh, distributed training middlewares like Torch.distributed or DPSpeed. So PyTorch, so the DPSpeed is uh, another distributed training middleware from Microsoft. So they have implemented it on the top of PyTorch. So you can also use MPI with the DP speed or the MRPH2 with DP speed. Same goes for the Torch or distributed. So it has native support for the distributed training and you can use uh, that support. So this is the kind of the performance you can get uh, nowadays. So if you do the, if you want to do the distributed uh, training using TensorFlow, you can reach up to 0 0.42 million images per second for the ImageNet 1K data set. So if you have 1500 GPUs, 1500 V100 GPUs, then you can get this kind of uh, performance. And since ImageNet has only 1.2 million images, you can complete one epoch of training in just three seconds. And we we all know that uh, it takes 90 epochs to train ResNet 50 model. So you can complete the entire training in 4.5 minutes. The training that used to take one day, two day or a week now can be done in just 4.5 minutes if you have access to these number of GPUs. The same is true for the CPUs also. So we, we did a similar study on uh, the Tech Frontera, which has uh, like a Cascade Lake uh, CPUs. So we, we scaled the TensorFlow to 2048 uh, nodes. And uh, here you can see that we are getting almost ideal speed up using MRPH 2X. And we reported a peak of 260,000 images per second. It is not as fast as GPUs, but it is not as that slow also. Like uh, earlier, there was a conception that, uh, or the misconception that uh, GPU, sorry, CPUs are 10X or 20X slower than GPUs, but this is not the case. If you have enough number of CPUs, you can do the distributed training or you can train your deep learning model on CPUs. So. The, the model that was taking four minutes or 4.5 minutes on 1500 GPUs will take around seven minutes on 2048 CPUs. So if you have enough number of CPUs, you can definitely train your model. So now uh, let's move to the other or the different kinds of uh, polarization strategies. This is relatively a new area 
or uh, a lot of research is going in this area. So data parallelism is uh, good. Like uh, we have already saturated most of the performance. Now the people are moving into the very, very large models that cannot be trained with data parallelism. Why? Because the models are so big that uh, they require more memory. They cannot fit inside the memory of a single GPU. So that's why we have model and hybrid parallelism. So in this uh, section, we are going to go over few case studies or the research papers in this direction. So the first paper is by the Google that is called G-Pipe. It works on top of TensorFlow. It uses point-to-point -point operations and it is for the GPUs. So now, since you cannot train a model on a single GPU because of memory requirement, you have to split the model on multiple GPUs. So this is called layer parallelism. Okay, let me take an example here. Let's say you have 100 layer model, okay? And you have four GPUs or four devices. So what you can do is you can place first 25 layers on device zero, next 25 layers on device one and so on. So how you will do the forward pass? You will do, first do the forward pass on first 25 layers on device zero. Then you will send the activations or the output of 25th layer to the next device using point to point operation. And then you will do the forward pass and you will do the backward pass in the similar manner. If you look into this approach, you will see that at any given time, we are only using one GPU. Since the training is sequential, so we are only using one GPU at a time. This is a serious underutilization of resources. We have, let's say you have thousand GPUs, but any at any given time, you are only using one GPU. This is not good. So what, GPI proposed was the pipeline parallelism. They, so, so what they did was like, uh, if you have, if you want to train your model with 128 batch size, then you will do the forward pass on device zero on first 20, on first 32 samples. Once the forward pass is complete, you will send the result to the next device so that it can work on first 32 samples. So in this way, they were able to add more compute and reduce the overall training time. So this is called the pipeline parallelism. Now let's move to the flex flow, which is also for the very, very large scale uh, deep neural networks. I think there is a question. Let me take a look. Okay, the question is by Charlie. Is there a lot more communication needed with the model parallelism? So, if we are only, so, okay. It depends on the kind of the model parallelism you are doing. If you are just doing the layer level model parallelism where you are placing different layers on the different models, then the communication will be less because now you are just doing the point to point uh, communication between two GPUs. If you are like, I'm going to talk about other kinds of polarization strategies and then, and there I will discuss like what level of communication you need. However, in if you compare the data parallelism and the layer parallelism, then the communication is less in layer parallelism or even in the pipeline parallelism. So, However, the performance is also not, uh, not that good. So please keep this thing in mind. So the flex flow uh, was proposed by Stanford and uh, they, ident they tried to identify more number of dimensions, more dimensions of parallelism in deep neural networks. So basically they developed the strategies or the search algorithms for finding the best polarization strategy. In their framework, it is a new deep learning framework. They proposed a new deep learning framework and they used a legion for the distributed training on the GPUs. 
now let's move into the hyperflow like so far we have talked about gpus let's look into the cpu side also when it comes to the pipeline and the hybrid parallelism so this is this work was done by our lab around two years ago so here let me first say why do we need hybrid parallelism why what are the limitations of data parallel training on the cpus so here you can see that we have a memory on the y axis and uh, on the x axis we have the input image size okay so the memory consumption in in deep neural network training depends on the size of the input if the input is small like uh, if we have the if we have an image of 32 pixels by 32 pixels then the memory requirement will be very low however if we increase the image size the memory requirement will also increase and at one point we won't be able to train the model on even cpus so this is what we are showing in this figure and so that is why we proposed hyperflow which uh, was uh, on top of tensorflow and keras models and it was exploiting mpi for point to point collectives okay so we developed the pipeline parallelism and combined it with the data parallel training to make it scalable okay so this is the kind of a performance you can expect from a hybrid training and uh, you can see that we were getting around 253x speed up on 256 nodes so this is around like 98% scaling efficiency so now let's move to the next one that's gems it focuses on uh, the gpu and the and improving the model parallel training okay so for a very very large images normally you will be able to train only one image okay so let me give you an example if you are if you increase the batch size the memory requirement will also increase okay so if you are able to fit a model on four gpus with the batch size of 1 if you increase the batch size then you will require eight gpus so instead of doing the pipeline parallelism on eight gpus you can just do pipe uh, layer parallelism on four gpus and use data parallel or the hybrid parallelism to get the better result so however when it comes to the training this is the memory utilization okay over the time if you are distributing the training on four gpus if you do the forward and backward pass in the forward pass your memory utilization will increase like uh, this one in this uh, at this time we are consuming all the memory of uh, gpu1 at this time we are consuming all the memories of uh, gpu1 and gpu2 so where are we consuming it to store the activations okay which are required to do the backward pass so once we are like uh, at the end of the forward pass we would have consumed all the memories of uh, all the GP memory of all the gpus in the backward pass the memory will decrease and it will increase again in the next iteration so here we have both free memory and the compute available so we proposed a gpu enabled memory aware model parallelism system to basically use this memory so i won't go into detail but uh, if you want to know more detail you can look at this paper published in supercomputing 2020 uh, 2020 conference so where will we use this kind of a system so here we are showing an use case of uh, model parallelism in ai driven digital pathology okay so in the digital pathology we have very very large images okay we have like 100000 by 100000 pixel images to give you a, a perspective in image net the size of the image is 224 by 224 so obviously this large image cannot fit in a single gpu memory so that's why we are extracting the tiles however the tile size is limited because of cpu memory 
So we cannot train with the 512 by 512 or 1024 by 1024 pixel tiles. So because of these small tiles, we will lose the structural information. So by using the model parallelism proposed in this work, we were able to train the model on larger number of tiles, sorry, larger tiles, and we were able to reduce the overall training time by using more GPUs. And uh, so basically here, like if you use the basic approach, you will do, you will finish the training in 7.25 hours on four GPUs using the basic model parallelism technique. If you use our proposed design, we can bring down the training time from seven hours to just 4.21 hours. And if you have more, num if you add more GPUs, then you were, you can, further decrease the training time to just 27 minutes. So this is the kind of the performance you can get if you use the right kind of polarization strategy. And in this, like in this polarization strategy, the communication was slightly higher than the data polar training. However, we are overlapping the communication with the compute. So you won't see the effect on the scalability. Uh, and uh, so that's why we are getting good scalability here. There is a question on the chat, I think. Let me take a look. Okay, where is it? Is it DMA in memory footprint? Okay. I'm not sure I understood this question. Amir or Hari, do you have any comment? No, um, Jingan, can you please explain this? Okay, while he explain it, yeah. let, let me move to the next one. Sorry, Dr. Panda. No, 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 let's go ahead. Um, I think we have um, hands on and others also. Okay, yeah. yeah. So let me move to the next slide. Hmm. I think he replied. So it's so it's moving from GPU to CPU RAM, right? Okay. Again, I'm not able to understand. Maybe we can follow follow up with this question later. So let me move to the next one. Okay. So now, since like uh, till now we were talking about the model parallel techniques for the models that cannot fit inside the memory of a single GPU. Okay, if the model is fitting inside the memory of a single GPU, then we will use data parallelism. However, we for some kind of a models, we can improve that performance by using the fine-grained polarization strategies and get the better performance compared to data parallelism. So, this paper was published in IPDPS 2021. So it was implemented in l band deep learning framework and it was using the large message collectives like uh, all gather, scatter, and uh, or reduce operation. So transformers are becoming popular in a deep learning community specifically for uh, natural language processing and the speech recognition areas. So they have a certain kind of a structure. So it's called multi-branch DNN architecture, where uh, like uh, you will fan out uh, the output of one layer into multiple layers, and then you will reduce the output uh, from these layers into one layer. So this is called the multi-branch DNN architecture. So in this paper, we proposed a combination of subgraph and data parallel uh, technique, a combination of subgraph and uh, data parallelism to get better performance. So in subgraph, we put uh, branch layers on different GPUs. So basically you can put layer two and layer three on GPU one, layer four and layer five on GPU2 and so on. And uh, 
we use data pillar technique for layer one and layer 10. So this is the kind of a fine grained pillarization uh, I was talking about. Okay, so in this case, the communication will increase, but you are you will be able to overlap that communication with the competition. So it will not affect your training performance. So this is the kind of a performance you will get if you use this technique. So we were able to get up to 3.05x speed up over data parallel designs on Lawrence Livermore National Lab Lesson Supercomputer. So we evaluated on 1024 GPUs, up to 1024 GPUs. So now the next one is uh, how can we utilize different polarization strategies to get better performance? Is it possible to utilize multiple polarization strategy and uh, to train out of core models or the models that doesn't fit inside the memory of a single GPU? So, uh, so here the motivation is that there is an emerging need for the integrated and spatial model parallelism solution. Like when you increase the image size, the memory requirement also increases. We tried to solve this issue using layer parallelism, but there is a limitation because in that limitation, a layer has to fit inside the memory of a single GPU. You cannot use it if the layer itself is not fitting inside that GPU. So that's why there are parallelism strategies like a spatial parallelism, which distributes the layer or the image itself on multiple GPUs. However, it results in mode communication. So that's why in this paper, we try to combine different dimensions of parallelism, like the image, layer, micro batch or the pipeline, bidirectional, the solution we proposed in GEMS in the previous paper and the data parallelism. So can we use all of these strategies to further improve the performance? So we proposed this system and we were able to get up to 2.2x over 2.02x speed up over the layer parallelism and the near linear scaling of 94.5 percentage on 2000 GPUs. This paper was, was published in uh, ISC 2022 conference. So if you want uh, to more, more, know more, please have a look at this paper. So I think there are a couple of questions on the chat. Let me take a look. Okay, so subgraph means sub model here. I meant in super, yeah, that's right. Uh, a deep neural network can be thought of a graph and you are placing a subgraph on, uh, on a different GPU. Thank you for your question, portion. So with that, I conclude a deep learning solution section and hand it over to Dr. Shafi to discuss ML and uh, DASK solutions. Thank you, Arpan. So you can see my slides? Yes, Amir, I can. Okay, so um, next we are going to talk about some of the ML solutions that we have developed. And in this context, we have previously talked about the QML library. So here we will talk about how we have, um, you know, developed some new solutions to paralyze and uh, optimize the QML um, library. So the QML library, just to put things into context, um, it comes from the NVIDIA Rapids project. And the overall, the overarching goal of this particular project is to build end-to-end -end data science uh, pipelines, and which is basically maintained on the GPU. Basically, a lot of the GPU applications today, data has to be moved between the GPU and the CPU, and that's just an overhead. So. Is it possible that we maintain all the data in the GPUs and uh, throughout the pipeline, essentially? Um, and QML is, you know, an important library uh, component of this ecosystem, and this can be thought of as a GPU-accelerated ML library, 
um, and it has support for multi-node, multi-GPU, which means that you know it's possible to scale out multiple, utilize multiple nodes equipped with NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and we have touched upon this point before that you know the conventional wisdom has been that you know only a DNNs are a good match for GPUs, but this is not true anymore because of the amount of data that we have available and you know the amount of data that these uh, classic machine learning algorithms process. So here are the main components of the QML library. So on the right hand side, you see essentially all of the APIs or you know the features are exported to the users through a Python interface and the interface looks very familiar to scikit-learn. Um, and then there is an algorithms layer and which sits on top of the primitives layer. So the idea of algorithms layer is obviously that, you know, um, as part of this particular project, QML, you know, uh, NVIDIA is trying to implement or provide all of the popular machine learning classic algorithms to you so that, you know, you don't have to re-implement those. But in case your favorite machine learning algorithm is not implemented, in that case, there are primitives available um, that you can utilize to, you know, implement these algorithms yourself. Um, another um, stack view of the QML library is as follows. So there is this Python API, which, you know, interacts with um, the core QML part, which is obviously for performance reasons is implemented using CUDA, C and C++ uh, programming language. Um, and this, the core component consists of algorithms, primitives, and it makes use of the CUDA libraries, the CUDA uh, computational toolkit. Uh, for parallelization, um, QML uses DAS plus UCX, and it's also capable of using Nickel. So the wisdom here is that, you know, the point-to-point -point functions from DASC and UCX are used um, for um, for point-to-point -point communication and for the initial bootstrapping of the execution. But for uh, collective communication, like all reduce or other uh, functions, the nickel communication library is uh, being used. Um, so, so basically this is how, you know, just like DNNs, you know, um, the parallel and distributed training can um, happen as follows. So for example, in this figure, uh, we are basically showing three stages. The first stage is what is called as the training stage. So we, uh, I mean, in this figure, we are showing two nodes, node one and node two, and each node has, let's say, three GPUs. And out of these total six GPUs, four of the GPUs are calling basically the uh, fit function, which basically means that, you know, we are conducting distributed training on four of the GPUs out uh, available on these two, two nodes. So uh, in this particular case, obviously a communication library, this purple thing is being used, which uses a variety of protocols like CUDA IPC, CUDA copy or GPU direct RDMA. Um, and these can be implemented through any kind of communication library. So this can be MOPH2 GDR, for example, or this can be nickel. So in the case of the vanilla QML release, this is obviously nickel. Um, and once the model has been trained or the fit function has been executed, in that case, you know, um, all the model parameters or the model itself is aggregated onto a single worker um, and it basically becomes available here. And then once you're trying to do, let's say inference, this, this model is then broadcasted to, you know, whichever GPU is essentially being involved in the predict function and predict is typically um, you know, taken as the, the inference. And in this particular case, this is basically an embarrassingly parallel predict that, you know, this predict is not talking to any other predict and the whole inference is going on on a single GPU. So um, moving on, um, what have we contributed to the QML software? So what we have done is that we have added MWAPISH2 GDR, the yellow box here, as, um, as a communication option in the existing QML software. So because MWAPISH2 GDR is obviously a C uh, MPI library, so in order to util utilize this or use this from the, the QML ecosystem, we are relying on a Python MPI library called MPI4Py. So MPI4Py also utilizes Cython wrappers. 
and it essentially is capable of invoking MPI communication primitives. So here are some of the uh, results that we have seen, and these were published in MLHPC workshop in November 2020. Um, so this is this happened as part of SC 2020. So if you just look at the k-means result here, so on the x-axis we have the increasing number of GPUs, on y-axis we have the training time, and then we are you know um, essentially we are training the k-means algorithm, and in this case um, the yellow and red graphs the own i mean we are in both configurations we are running qml but the only difference has been you know replacing nickel communication with mwapish 2 gdr and we uh, essentially saw uh, at least for uh, you know for qml around for on 32 gpus we saw around 1.6 times speed up and we saw similar speed ups for other um, algorithms like nearest neighbor linear regression and truncated svd as well so for more details, you, you can, um, you know, go to this website, uh, sorry, go, go and check out our paper um, that has much more details. And by the way, this QML software has been released as an open source software. So, um, well, I mean, QML is obviously from the Rapids project, it's an open source software, but, you know, our additions to the QML software in the form of incorporating MWPS2 GDR have also has also been made public and it's available from our website. Um, with this now, uh, I move to the DASC solution. So um, in this context, um, what we have done is we have actually made um, a software called MPF for DASC. And if you recall, when I introduced DASC, we talked about um, the fact that DASC originally has two communication backends. One is TCP um, and the second one is UCX. So these two, if you down, go download, you know, uh, DAS today, you should be able to work with these. Uh, but what we have done is we have added in a third option, which is what we call MPF for DAS, which is an MPI based communication backend for uh, DAS. Um, and this basically optimizes CPU and GPU based communication inside the DAS framework for modern HPC clusters. Um, so here is the DASC architecture. Um, it, lo it looks a little complicated, but let me explain that for you. So starting from the top, we have the DASC layer. And in this, uh, we have basically different characteristics and features that DASC ecosystem provides. So for example, if you're working, if you're writing a DASC application today, you might be working with different data structures like DASC arrays, DASC bags, DASC data frames. And the good thing about these different data structures is that they extend the, you know, the available Python arrays and table like, uh, you know, like the Pandas uh, library. So if you're already familiar with, let's say NumPy, I mean, working with Dask arrays would be very similar for you. Um, and under the hoods, you know, I explained this a little bit earlier that when your Dask program executes this, the, um, it will be the runtime is going to convert your application into a task, into a big graph, and then basically execute that graph lazily. So Dask also provides some, you know, uh, extra packages to help faci facilitate execution on HPC systems like Dask MPI. So Dask MPI is an existing software that lets you bootstrap Dask execution using an MPI library. So, I mean, if you have to, let's say, start an, a parallel execution on a modern cluster with thousand processes, that itself is a big challenge. And MPI libraries have been doing that for a long time. And it makes sense to reuse the, all that effort. And Dask MPI is essentially doing exactly that. Uh, Dask CUDA is from the NVIDIA Rapids project. So it's adding some facilities, um, utilities to facilitate our Dask execution on the GPUs. Um, and DAS job queue is a package that helps you interact, that lets you interact with job schedulers installed on, you know, um, on HPC systems. But really the heart here or the main component here in the, in the context of parallel and distributed computing is the DAS distributed layer. So this provides the notion of scheduler, worker and client. And as we discussed um, out of the box, DASC will give you the option to use TCP and UCX 
And we have added support for MPA for DAS that, that utilizes MPA, MWAPH2, GDR communication primitives through you know, the Python um, MPA library called MPA for Py. So um, here we are going into some somewhat more details. Um, so basically we are utilizing the Dask MPI project to bootstrap execution. Um, and in this case, it's pretty simple. So for example, in this case, we have started five MPI processes and the Dask MPI software will actually assign different MPI processes, the role of scheduler workers and the client. So for example, if you're bootstrapping using Dask MPI, so your process zero would become the scheduler, your process one would become the client process and two, three, four, and any processes beyond you know, two would become the worker processes. Um, and as part of implementing MPA for DAS, one of the challenges was that we had to implement point-to-point -point communication um, uh, functions inside Python core routines. Um, so, I mean, here we are, presenting the pseudocode for those, um, you know, um, communication coroutines. And as you can see here, I mean, if, if you're familiar with this low level MPI programming, um, here, you know, we are set, I'm just focusing on the left-hand side box here, which is basically doing the sending. The receive communication coroutine is the same. So we are basically sending the message. And after that, we are testing. And we are actually testing if our, you know, sent message has actually been sent inside a while while loop and the reason for doing that is that if we just you know send the message and let's say check the message completion through a blocking wait function or even with the test function you know if we do this in a loop um, it's possible to uh, end up in hangs uh, because in communic in in coroutines uh, in python coroutines if there is a function which is doing IO operation, it has to yield the CPU or the GPU to other um, coroutines executing on, um, on, on the system. So if you see this uh, strange async IO dot sleep zero line, this is exactly what it's um, essentially doing here. So um, with this, I'll present some, some of the performance numbers that we have seen. So in this particular case, we are, um, you know, showing numbers for a Coupa array and its transpose. So th this application, what it does is it initializes a Coupa array. Um, so Coupa is basically the GPU equivalent of the NumPy arrays. So we take that array, we take a transpose of that array, and then we simply take some of the respective elements. Um, and as you can see, X axis again, here is the you know increasing number of Dask workers y axis here is the total execution time um, and we are mainly focusing on the yellow and red lines um, the yellow line is U ucx essentially um, and as you can see you know at with more number of gpus the ucx line the total execution time is coming down but you know we see better performance with using mpf for das and this is around 1.71 times better on average than ucx alone and it's actually around uh, four X better than, um, you know, TCP. So MPF for Dask again has been published as an open source software. So it's currently 0.2 release. So, uh, and it can be acquired from um, this particular um, website. And the paper describing um, these results and more details on MPF for Dask was published in CC Grid 2021. So um, I would invite all of you to go and, um, look at that if you're interested in learning more details. So um, this is another application which is called QDF Merge. Um, and again, you know, I will not go into a lot of details here, but on average, we are seeing around 2.9 times better performance than um, UCX. Um, and um, basically these are two uh, different metrics of the same application. So on the left-hand side, we are printing the total execution time, plotting the total execution time. And on the right-hand side, we are uh, printing the merge throughput gigabytes per second achieved for uh, this particular application. So with this now, I will conclude uh, 
the MLDL solutions. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Um, so I don't see any questions. So I will hand it over to Dr. Parna for open issues and challenges. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Amir. Um, so let me... Um... Can you see the my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have around like a, another half an hour left. So let me try to talk a little bit about the open issues and challenges, and then we'll go through the hands-on exercises. Um, so as you saw, I mean, this field is like a continuously evolving. I mean, just in the last several years, a lot of work has happened, but as the field is moving, there are a lot of people have been talking about all these open issues. So I'll at least touch five of these. One is the convergence of machine learning, deep learning, data science, and HPC, scalability and large batch size training, and uh, MLDL benchmarks and thoughts on standardization, open exchange and making AI accessible, and then the data science frameworks and, and GPUs. So if you look at this, this convergence issue, um, the question is, first question is, is machine learning, deep learning, a data science and HPC problem or not? Okay. I mean, as we discussed, obviously, I mean, if you take a look at the distributed model training, uh, DNN training is definitely an HPC problem. But if you take a look at the inference, it's not yet an HPC problem, okay? But there are newer kinds of applications coming. If you just take an inference with a short time interval or, or let's say a lot of inferences happening at the in a short time interval, it may be an high throughput computing problem, sometimes known as HTC. Okay, that means a single inference. I don't want to speed up, but I have like a millions of these inferences coming back to back and I need to process them very quickly. So that could be, we can still use an HPC environment. Um, it's just like, you know, in an HPC center, you submit millions of jobs and then uh, short short jobs. Um, we need that resources, common file system uh, to spread it across uh, CPUs, GPUs. So that may become like an also HPC problem. And then, of course, support for data science frameworks on HP systems is improving. Uh, but unlike machine learning, deep learning, they have gone a little bit much more ahead. So here things are lagging. Why HPC can help? As we saw in some of the situation, I mean, people have been developing HPC middleware for almost last 30, 30 years, uh, whereas the machine learning, deep learning softwares have just come for the last uh, seven to eight years. So there is a lot of inherent challenge, inherent uh, uh, like a knowledge in the designing MPI library, PGAS library, other communication run times, and that can actually help for the data parallel training. And some of the needs are an exact match. That means these we saw like a machine learning or deep learning, there is a compute intensive problem and it should be able to really take advantage of the HPC systems. And we also saw there are some needs for the, like a large message communication, could have air communication. Um, so we take a lot of knowledge from the HPC side and then apply it to the machine learning deep learning. So then if we take a look at the training itself, um, there is a lot of research going on, a lot of debate, um, how fast we can improve the training, but with also a higher accuracy, okay? We just don't want to just accelerate it, but we want to accelerate it with a good accuracy. And we had some discussion earlier about the batch size. Uh, obviously, if your batch size is large, it will improve the scalability because there is a lesser communication and more computation before synchronization. But there is a limit to the large batch size. Okay, And this is where a lot of active research is going on. Uh, the HPC community can also investigate overlapping techniques, latency hiding techniques. Those, those are open issues. Now, if you take a look at the DNN size, we touched a little bit. I think Arpan indicated about the when we moved from data parallelism to the model parallelism. As the model sizes are becoming larger and larger, you cannot fit them into a single GPU or even to the memory of a single CPU server. So here, if you take a look at this, like one of really large model, it has 137 billion parameters. Okay, So that is leading to this out-of-code training for GPUs. So just like many years back, if you remember like the almost 20 years back when the parallel computing started, people were trying to do shorting. Shorting is a very important application, but then if the if the data set doesn't fit into the memory of either a single node or a multiple node, how do you handle that? So this is what used to be called like out of code shorting. So similar ideas are coming now with respect to out of code training for GPUs. 
uh, and and we open showed some of the issues like a model parallelism. You can take data in and out. Um, Nvidia is working on VDNN. Uh, there are different solutions are coming up with pruning the network. We, our group, we did some out of core cafe earlier. Similarly, um, some of the uh, deep speed and all these newer frameworks are also trying to handle uh, out of core DNN. Now, as this field is evolving, then people are asking questions. Can we have a standardized interface? Um, just like the HPC, um, if you go back 30 years, there was not, MPI standard was not there. Every system had their own communication library with either its own APIs and all, then it was very hard to move an application from one machine to the other machine. So then the similar kind of things people are asking whether there will be a deep learning interface. And in that case, what will be a good starting point? Will it come from the HPC community or DL community? Can there be collaboration across communities? So these are all again, open issues. Now with respect to same questions also apply to benchmarking. Because people have been showing, I think we show, show one slide we described. There are so many layers from your frameworks to to the the uh, to, to the, uh, uh, the the MKL models and all those things. So you need to do a very fair comparison. And is there a standard benchmarks? So there have been a lot of effort here, like HKU benchmark, Swami Chintala's benchmark, Don Bench. But recently, this ML Perf, I think some of you must be familiar with that. That is actually um, uh, gathering a lot of attraction in the community. It takes a lot of time. It has realistic data set, but it takes hours and hours to run. But that's how in one way people are trying to see whether we can converge uh, to, to have some uh, standardized interface. Then the other questions are open exchange and making AI accessible. There are two directions taking place. One is open AI. This is company focused towards making AI accessible and open. It is backed by several industry partners here as listed. Uh, DALI, there is a, it's trying to create realistic images and art from the description in the natural language. And at the same time, there is this Onyx format, which is coming up to exchange trade models. So the idea, let's say, is continuously these models evolve. Uh, as, as we discussed earlier, like a few years back, CAFE used to be the biggest one, then CAFE 2, then TensorFlow, Python. So let's say you have done investment, quite a lot of investment using one, one uh, of such frameworks and that framework dies then what do you do? Do you need to retrain everything or can you actually exchange whatever the train model to the newer framework? So this actually requires cross framework compatibility. This, has, this was created by Facebook and Microsoft. Um, so currently these TensorFlow core MLs are um, supported uh, here. Now, if you go to the data science framework, as Amir uh, indicated, I mean, there are very exciting results. The newer kinds of results, what we are getting, the support for GPUs has been added to the task as a part of the NVIDIA Rapids project. And, uh, but at the same time, there is a fusion which is taking place from this task and also the all other big data um, framework like the Apache Spark and all. Um, so the, how do you design these plugins for handling SQL queries or supple plugin based on UCX? So this field is opening up. Um, for better and better solutions. So there are a lot of opportunities here uh, to utilize the GPU-GPU communication provided by MPI libraries like mip 2 gdr We showed some initial numbers, but this is just the initial steps. There could be a lot of other optimizations um, happening along this direction. And, and just like uh, we remember, we showed like a high DL framework uh, where we have linked with the MPI, similar kind of challenges comes. Can the data science be linked uh, to an MPI? So that will actually lead to a truly converged software stack, like using an MPI library, because most of the large scale systems have MPI libraries. And then if you can link to these MPI libraries, your HPC, machine learning, deep learning, Dask, even uh, big data stacks like Spark and all, it will actually provide you a converged interface uh, so that very complicated workflows you should be able to handle just using the MPI framework, okay? So that is the kind of the directions where we are going. So are there any questions? Um, I see on the chat, um, let me quickly take a look. Uh, Dr. Pana, Amir answered this question. Oh, yeah, you have, okay. So then um, to, to save the time, so what, what we'll do is there are some hands-on exercises. I'm, I'm hopeful that you have created these accounts and all, but uh, if some of you have time constraints, I know it is becoming uh, almost uh, 7.40 in the East Coast. Let me go and formally conclude the presentation, okay? Um, 
but of course, I mean, we'll be here, then we'll, we'll continue with the hands-on exercises for all of those you are interested in. Uh, but if you have some time constraint, you don't have to uh, wait until the end. So, so let me move a little bit quickly here. Um, uh, and uh, finish the uh, conclude. So formally, if you see in this last uh, like a three and a half hours, what we started with a very 100,000 feet level of this machine learning, deep learning, AI and all, we provided an overview of issues, challenges and opportunities uh, to how to design the efficient communication right, runtime and sort some of the initial um, results. Uh, the state of what the at the solutions, uh, and you will be soon seeing a set of hand, hands on exercises so that you will also get a feel uh, for these kind of results. But of course, these are new directions, and as you can see, like uh, it needs collaborative efforts from many different people, starting from architects to middleware level designers to to DL framework designers to data scientists. So by effectively working all these people together, then only the community will be trying to um, move ahead. Uh, in the successive years. So with that, let me um, give thanks to um, um, all our sponsors. Uh, uh, without them, it is very hard to carry out the type of research what we are doing here and trying to share all these results to you. But more importantly, these are all my heroes. Uh, what we are trying to show here is actually, uh, if you take a look at the MAPIS project, we started almost in year 2000. So it is a 22 years of work. So a lot of students and staffs have come to my group, they have contributed. And um, so I would like to every presentation, we actually provide uh, big credits to, 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 to all of them. So, so with this, I'll conclude here. These are all my all the contacts. Um, if you have any questions, you can indicate. I also want to indicate like, uh, since we talked here about a lot of this MPI based library, uh, in fact, the coming Monday to Wednesday, uh, we have a um, annual user group conference. We call it MHAPIC user group conference or called MUG. Uh, we have a three days packed program. Um, might be uh, Arpan or Amir can post a link. Um, yeah, and it's being, it is it's being held in a hybrid manner. You will see a lot of vendors, sponsors will be talking. There are two keynote talks, uh, eight tutorials. Um, 18 invited talks, a lot of student poster presentation, a short talks. So if any one of you are interested, please feel free to join and you'll see a lot of things what we are talking here are actually being also done by industry and you will see a lot of similar kind of results uh, for, from them. Um, so with this, let me hand it over to Arpan. I believe Arpan, you will start with the hands-on uh, and yes, then sir. it will move to Amir. And um, hopefully in the next uh, 20 minutes, you will get an idea of, of these uh, exercises. Um, and and by the way, these exercises are all available to you. Um, you can take them and run it on your systems also. Okay. Go ahead, Arpan. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Panda. I hope you can see my terminal and the presentation. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So let's... So this is the overview of hands-on exercises. We have four labs for you. In first two labs, we are going to do distributed training using PyTorch and TensorFlow. Then in lab three, we are going to do distributed uh, machine learning using QML. And at the end, uh, we will polarize the data science applications using Dask. So I will cover lab one and lab two. I hope you are able to log in into RI2 cluster. If you have not done it yet, please go to this uh, uh, URL and uh, take a account uh, for you. Pick account for you and you can use that account to log in into the cluster. I have already logged in into the cluster, but let me just do it again. So I'm just going to search into RI2. I have a shortcut. You cannot do it, but uh, like I have a shortcut on this system. So you will be in the head. So just let me go to the tutorials directory. I think uh, tutorial accounts will go directly into those directories. So you don't have to go anywhere. And uh, AD labs, okay. So we have four lab folders here for you along with the readme file. So you don't have to 
copy any commands from the presentation you can just follow the readme file and you will be able to run the experiments so i have another terminal open here so let me just open readme file here okay so let's do the lab one first so in the lab one the objectives are how to train a pytorch model on a single nvidia gpu so we are going to look at the performance of uh, resnet 50 model on a single nvidia gpu and then we are going to compare it with uh, multiple gpus so this is ri2 system and uh, it has uh, v100 gpus per node so it has a uh, uh, nvidia v volta v100 gpu with uh, 32 gb of ram and each node has one v100 gpu so let's uh, run our first task in lab one that is running pytorch on a single gpu so if you open your readme file you will find all the commands here so first you need to cd into the lab one directory so let me just do it here okay once you are inside the lab one directory you can use this command to run task one okay so let me just do it now so here you will see that we are so this is the command we are running so we have a reservation for you on this system so you will hopefully get a note very soon if you submit your job so you can see that here i'm just this is my like absolute path to the python and then i'm just using calling this a script okay python synthetic benchmark so this is a standard script from horoword so you can use it in your benchmarking also okay here i'm giving the arguments like a bed size should be equal to 64 and i want to run it for five iterations so then you will see this kind of a result you will have like the model we are running is resnet 50 bed size is 64 and we are running it on one gpu so we are able to process around 333 images per second on this gpu now let's run this the same experiment on two gpus using mrpitch 2 gdr so i have already installed horoword on this system and configured it with the mrpitch 2 gdr so we are going to use the mrpitch 2 gdr to run this uh, experiment so just run this command the third one and uh, once you run it so now the command is something different the run command is something different because we are going to launch two processes so we are going to use npr and rsh which is which is a launcher by emma pitch 2 you can use npr run also if you want or npr exec we are running it uh, we are running two processes here so that's why two we were allocated gpu 0 and gpu 2 so gpu 0 1 and gpu 0 2 so here we are just listing them and here are the some environment variables to get good performance and after that we are just running the python like the previous experiment and calling the same script with the same hyperparameters okay so one thing to note here is that uh, we are running 64 like the 64 samples per gpu so we are doing a weak scaling we are so as we increase the number of gpus our batch size will also increase and you can see that we are able to process almost the double the number of images so this is like uh, getting around 1.9x uh, speed up. Uh, are you able to run these experiments? If anyone can tell me, it would be great. Great, thanks, Minje. So if you have any question, please let me know or else I can proceed to the next uh, lab. Let let's wait for a minute so that you can complete uh, this lab
process 631 images on two GPUs. Yes, your number may be different because uh, there are some variation. You can also see here that I'm getting different number of images per second on in different iterations, but uh, the ballpark will be like 620 to 635 or something like that. The actual number may change. Thanks. Okay, so let's proceed to the next lab. In this lab, we are going to do the same thing for the TensorFlow so that we can first, we can compare the single node and multi-node performance for TensorFlow and compare it with the PyTorch, okay? So I know where, where is this one? So just cd dot 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 slash lab two, okay? So now you are in lab two. We are going to like, uh, if you go to lab two, there are commands for the TensorFlow section. So we are going to run it on single node first. So just copy this command and uh, paste it. So now we are, uh, when we run TensorFlow, it is going to print out uh, information like uh, it is able to find CODN and it is able to open dynamic uh, coup parts. It is able to find uh, how many number of GPUs uh, did it find? How many, like, is it able to find CUDA or not? So it is going to print all of this information. So as you can see that it, it has successfully opened CODNN, CUPLAS, and other uh, helper libraries. So let's wait for uh, a few seconds here to get the result. So as you can see, we ran the same model, ResNet 50, with same batch size, that is 64, and on one GPU. So we are processing around 338 images per second. If you remember, in PyTorch, we were processing around 333 images. In our experiments, and you know, like we have ran these experiments several times, we have found that TensorFlow is slightly faster for this model when compared to PyTorch. Okay. Um, Arpan, there's a question I think you will be showing, uh, is asking what is the command for lab two? I think you will, you will tell that in the next slide. Yeah. Oh, I think I already showed it in the, okay. Okay. Uh, so one second, um, this, there is a zoom bar over it. I'm not able to change my terminal. Come on, go over. Yeah. Okay. So if you open the readme file, you will find the command to run TensorFlow experiment in TensorFlow section, this one. So you just need to copy this command. Okay. Let me just paste it on uh, the chat also. But you need to first SSH, sorry, CD into lab two folder. So please do it before running this command. So now let's move to the multi-node experiment with the TensorFlow and Horoor. So I'm just going to copy this command from this section from here and uh, just paste it. So in this case, we will run training on multiple GPUs, okay? So you can see that uh, TensorFlow is printing that I'm able to find Tesla V100 PCIe 32 GB card. So let's wait for a few seconds. So now you can see that we are able to process 626 images per second for the TensorFlow and it is like 1.85x or 1.9x speed up just like PyTorch. And uh, yeah, we can also see that the PyTorch TensorFlow is slightly better than 
the PyTorch. So with this, the key takeaways from the deep learning labs are like, if you want to run the data pilot training, or if you do, if you want to evaluate the performance, you can use this website and get the example scripts. Single and multiple GPU jobs are similar. You can just launch them using the same command. Horovod can be configured with the MPI, Glue, Nickel, and 1CCL. So when you are installing Horovod, if you are providing the MPI path and enabling the, uh, and telling the Horovod to configure it with the MPI, it will use MPI for the communication. If you have Nickel, then it will use Nickel. But, how, but you have to do it when you are installing Horovod. And uh, MRPS2 GDR offers near linear speed up for a multi node training. And uh, the TensorFlow gives slightly better performance than PyTorch for the ResNet 50. So now let's uh, go to the next one. So with this, I hand over to Amit to talk about LF3 and LF4. Yeah, so we might take like another five, six minutes. We can finish. I think we're almost finishing. Yeah. Amir, please proceed. Right. So you see my screen? Yeah. Yes. So basically, I will now be running lab three. And in lab three, what I want to show is um, basically run K means um, on, a, on a single GPU. So if you go to the readme, um, so I have the readme open here as well. Um, you just need to copy this let's say the first cd command um i'll just paste here and then i go i run um i copy this command and in this command i'm basically running the k means algorithm using a single gp so i'm just pasting the command and you will see that you know this will um run the k means algorithm i mean we are dealing with data set that has um around 25000 uh, data points and then each data point has 298 um, features so this will execute on a single gpu and on the right hand side if you see we expect this to be completed in around 30 seconds um, and th this is basically running for maximum 3000 iterations so now what i'll do is i'll just go i will try and run the same program with um, on two GPUs. And in this case, I'm actually increasing the problem size. And how am I increasing that? I'm increasing um, the total number of iterations that it's supposed to run. So if you look at the right-hand side, the, the slide showed saying maximum iterations is 6,000. In the previous one, it was 3,000. Uh, 3, so in this case, um, if it returns back close to 30 seconds, it means that you know we are getting the ideal speed up. So obviously it will not return back in 30 seconds, but you know, something close. So in, in the run shown on the right hand side um, slide, it returned back in 33 seconds. So which is which is pretty pretty good C, uh, speed up when going from one GPU to um, two GPUs. So it should be returning soon. So in this case, I mean, in, in our run right now, it ran for 30, 32 seconds, which is pretty imp impressive speed up. Um, so with this, um, I move to the fourth um, lab, which is the Dask lab. Um, so in this case, there is a little bit of a setup work. So I'll just um, copy this command, paste it. I'm basically going to the right location. Um, and after that, I'm copying some material. So I will just, I will first make directory and then I'm copying some material that we want you to edit because otherwise the material is read only. Um, so in this case, we have now two files. One is this Coupai bench and run Coupai bench. So first let me just run this benchmark that we talked about. Uh, which is called sum of Cooper array with this transpose. So I'll just take this and I will run this. So what while it's running and it's giving me an error, so let me 
Ah, uh, you. No, I, I think you need to go into lab four. That's right. Yes, I didn't go into the right folder. So now I'm in that folder, and I'm gonna run the run Coupa benchmark. And while it's running, I will just show you on the right hand side what to expect. So on the right hand side, it's showing it's going to go and run this um, sum of Coupa array and its transpose benchmark. Um, and I know the font is a little small here. Um, let me try and make it bigger. So, you know, th this is the expected output. So we are basically using Dask MPI and MOPH2. We are running the DAS program. Um, the client here basically shows that it's, you know, this is the IP address of, or the URL of the scheduler. The two processes here mean that, you know, it's connected to uh, workers and then, you know, how many threads and how many total. And we are going to repeat this experiment for five iterations. And the average with TCP is going to be around 12.57 seconds. So if you see on the left-hand side now, Two iterations have executed. The first one is always a little higher. So this is 18. The second one is 13. And, you know, it will run for a few more iterations. Uh, and after that, we will have the median wall clock time for the TCP run. And once that's complete, then what we are going to do is that we are going to switch from the TCP to the MPI communication device. And I'll show you how easy that is with MPA for Dask. Um, and, you know, you will see the gains as well. So, so we got the results. The median walkout time is 13.57 seconds. So the next task, the next step is that we'll go and we will edit Coupai benchmark. And we just go to this file, replace TCP string with MPI. I will save that. And I will run the same command again. So everything is same. I've just changed TCP to MPI. And, you know, it's all written down in the slides and in the readme. Um, and now, you know, this should run substantially faster. So on if I show you the slide on the right-hand side, the same program with all the same parameters, it should now essentially execute in... Uh, around four uh, seconds, which should be, you know, compared to TCP, it's around three X or three times faster. So, you know, as, as you can see, it's, it's running um, and it should soon run to completion. So, yeah, as you can see, you know, TCP ran in 13.57 uh, seconds and with MPI for DAS, uh, this, the same program completed in 3.82 seconds. So with this, I essentially conclude um, lab four. Okay, um, thanks, Amir. Um, I uh, are there any general questions? I think we are coming close to the, the to the final ones. Um, we are three minutes uh, behind the schedule, but um, I I hope all of you got an idea uh, of all the latest things happening in the machine learning, deep learning, and data science, and how the community is working towards it. Um, so it has been a long day. I, I see some of you also attended the, the morning one. It is almost uh, 8 o'clock in the East Coast uh, afternoon. Um, so we'd like to thank all of you again. Uh, and if you have any feedback, feedback or comment, uh, please feel free to send us by email. And I believe the recording will also be available. And you have a copy of the slide. So, uh, with that, uh, we just want to say bye. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you for attendees and the presenters. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Sudhir. Thanks, Sudhir. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.